here. Charles Menudo. Present. John Lusner. Vinny Toronto. Here. John Windsor. Here. Terry Castro. Here. David Lane. Here. Laura Lee Thompson. Here. Stephanie Ely has asked to be excused. Uh, Mel Martin. Here. Courtney Barker. Here. Todd Swingle. Dennis Basil. Here. John Luther, John Luther, sorry. <coughs> and Danielle. And me. Oh, sorry, Danielle. Danielle Bowden. Here. All right, so I think we're going to um, switch gears from what we normally do in these meetings. We have some new faces, and um, I thought it would be appropriate for us to take a few minutes today to go around the table and introduce ourselves for the new people. Feel free to take a minute or two. Um, let us know what your reason for wanting to serve on the committee is. I think it's important for us to know that and learn a little bit about you. Um, us existing members, we know each other. But uh, you know, I, remember, I remember a couple of years ago when I got the opportunity to introduce myself. And I remember it was, it was a chance for me to you know, do one of those you know, mad as hell and I'm not going to take it any more moments. Um, and I would encourage all of you to... to to enjoy that kind of freedom here. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's cathartic, if nothing else. So um, if we don't mind starting over here with uh, Christine, and uh, we'll go around. Yes, good morning. I'm Christine Vallier. I'm the Assistant County Attorney for Natural Resources and also to support the COC. I'm Dennis Basil, new member. Uh, I am uh, a realtor. Uh, have been since 1973 in Brevard County. I moved here in 1967 with my family. Um, my reason to serve is uh, I, I used to scuba dive in the Indian River oh. Lagoon, and I wouldn't do that anymore. Uh, I've seen the changes over time. Um, I understand some of the biology, I think, and I'd like to see it get back to the way it was. Hi, I'm Danielle Bowden. Um, I, I'm serving on the Oversight Committee because I grew up playing in the lagoon. My dad is a retired commercial fisherman, and, um, and the water's different from when I was in there. I used to play, and I want my children to be able to play in the same waters. And it's important to me that their children will also have the same opportunity. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Vinny Toronto, Chief Information Officer for the State Attorney's Office. Um, I uh, am passionate about the lagoon like everyone else here. Born and raised here. Uh, I was born three years after you got here, Dennis. I don't want to date you. Anything, but, you know, you got to haze those first members. You got to haze them. I thought about that, too. You got to haze those first members as soon as they get here. No. Um, but uh, uh, so uh, I, I, like Danielle and Dennis, have seen the water change. And uh, my grandparents, um, many good memories. Um, both my grandfather and grandmother uh, on the lagoon and uh, I want that same opportunity um, for others and I think it's a, a, as a body it, it can really bring us together and when you see fishermen that are out there it doesn't matter where their background is or who they are it, it kind of is a family and um, I, I really think that that can bring a community together so uh, I, I want to do what I can to help. My name is John Luznar, um, alternate technology um, underneath uh, Vinny. Uh, I work for BRPH, uh, Vice President. Uh, one of the things, I grew up um, on the north side of the lagoon, up in Oak Hill. I was actually born in Daytona Beach. Family was raised in Daytona Beach. Uh, my relatives, my aunt and uncle, homesteaded in Oak Hill. Um, I've played in there my whole life, and I've seen the changes, and I, and I know we can get it back to, to its original state. Um, one of the things is, you know, some things, if we let Mother Nature take its, you know, its pace, it'll, it'll change. And some of the, you know, a lot of things that we're doing now that I see that the lagoon, you know, we're trying to fix it and so forth, it's progress. I know we can get it back. It's just going to take time and some money, a lot of money to get it back. But uh, if we can clean up Lake Erie and a lot of the other shores like the Chesapeake, I know we can get this back to where it was originally at keep that for the future state, for the future people. Great. So, Good morning. I'm Charlie Venuto, and I'm the Science Alternate Chair, and I welcome to our new members, some familiar faces and some uh, new faces. And um, I've, uh, <clears throat> I'm the Director of Environmental Health and Safety at the uh, 
Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex for Delaware North. I also mm -hmm. teach uh, part-time on a, at an online university, and you know, I got, had, had the opportunity to work my master's thesis on a lagoon back in the late 1970s, and certainly working with commercial fishermen, uh, catching some of the samples that I used. I've seen a lot of deterioration. And so very uh, interested in uh, helping us restore the lagoon to the water quality that it ought to have. Um, and again, welcome, everybody. My name is Lorraine Koss. Uh, I'm not a native. I developed my environmental ethic growing up next to the Mississippi and pursued a career in water quality, ended up marrying a native and living next to the lagoon and loving it and wanting to uh, pursue restoring it. I have 30 years in water quality policy and communications. Uh, my master's degree is in environmental management. Good morning, Melissa Martin. Um, this is cathartic. Uh, I have. Uh, I was born and raised in the Orlando area, right next to Wakaira Springs State Park, and uh, so I grew up a default environmentalist. Didn't even know it until I realized there were people out there who didn't care about the environment. Um, I retired from the Marine Corps in 2014 and brought my family here uh, to Coco. Uh, because it was very important to me that, like Danielle said, we, uh, we pass on these cherished memory opp opportunities to the kids. And <clears throat> my dad didn't really get out much. He was either working or just didn't get out much. And so one of the very few memories that I cherish growing up is him teaching me how to cast a net, you know, perfectly in a circle or, you know, how to, how to fish, how to crab. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, and so when he passed in 2009, those types of memories just became even more important to me, um, more worth fighting for. And so uh, in 2016, uh, actually it was, this was before the, the fish kill when uh, a, a few of us were trying to figure out how to solve these water issues in the lagoon. And um, I was very honored to be asked to join this, uh, this circle of people who really care. And <clears throat> as we were organizing, the fish kill happened, so we got on uh, hyperdrive and decided to uh, help educate the community and, and start that whole role. And fortunately, there was uh, bravery on the commission that said, let's do the right thing, and um, enabled us as a citizenry to uh, make the right call in November of 2016. I was, I was very honored to be a part of that whole process <clears throat> with the Lagoon Coalition, with all of the organizations and government agencies and businesses, and everyone stepped up. And I think that was a beautiful moment in our, in our timeline, mm -hmm. if you think about it. And so um, I did try to... Uh, help out at the state level and ran for a state senate last year. Um, and I'm here, so obviously you know the results. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to be part of the process. And I am a process girl. I'm hoping to channel the derky um, and, wow. and ask, the, ask the hard questions, make this a lively discussion. <laughs> I'm very, uh, yeah, I'm very, um, hopeful and I believe that we can do a lot of good things uh, while maintaining the public trust, answering the questions as they come along, and uh, get things done. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is David Lane. <clears throat> I, uh, I own an outdoor center in Cocoa Beach called A1A Beach Rentals and Outdoor Center. Um, about half of our business is lagoon related. Um, but that's not why I serve. I serve because I, I grew up on Merritt Island. I'm, I, too, was born three years after Dennis moved here. Um, um, I would be hard-pressed to find a memory, you know, under 15 years of age that's not lagoon-related. Um, I would ride my bike to Hubert Humphrey Bridge to go fishing after school or behind the mall to go fishing up the seawall, uh, what are now Merritt Towers, um, or Kiwanis Island, or anywhere my bike would take me, you know, and, and not risk getting hit by traffic. Um, I didn't play video games. I, you know, I played sports, but um, my passion was fishing. There's not a creek or a pond or a ditch, you know, in Central Merritt Island that I didn't fish and know everything about. Um, 
And you know, growing up, you, you you slowly see the degradation of the lagoon and pollution and muck and you know water quality disappearing and seagrasses disappearing. Um, and it's just sad. And you keep waiting for somebody with more authority than you to do something about it. And as I grew into adulthood and went to college and you know had a professional career, moved back here from Michigan, I realized um, this is something that you know I could help participate in. And when we had the fish kill in 2016, when we formed the, uh, the committee and we, we passed the half cent sales tax in 2016, I, I realized this was, this was it. This was our opportunity to facilitate change. Um, so I'm very honored to be on the board. Um, and um, very excited to see the things that are happening in two short years. Um, we're seeing improvements and places where projects are being completed, fish are returning, and dolphin are swimming again. And waterfront homeowners can see more than six inches into the water. And um, I'm, I get giddy with excitement because I just know it's around the corner. It's we're gonna we're, in our lifetimes we're gonna we're gonna experience the lagoon again the way we remember, so um, that's why I serve and I'm very happy and blessed to be here. Great, thank you. My name is Laura Lee Thompson. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, like like the rest of y'all, I grew up on the Indian River Lagoon. My grandfather ran the Titusville Fishing Pier, and so I was one of those kids on bikes too with fishing poles. Um, <laughs> And I've fished the lagoon my entire life. In fact, four generations of my family have made a living um, commercially fishing the lagoon. And so for the last 30 years, I, I've had to suffer the tragedy of what's happened to the lagoon and what's happened to the commercial fishing industry in the lagoon. It's impossible for someone to make a, a living out of the lagoon. And, and thousands of people made a living out of the lagoon when I was a kid. Um, I'm a co-owner of Dixie Crossroads Seafood Restaurant in Titusville, and uh, my dad built commercial fishing boats and, and pleasure boats, so we, my family's always been associated with the lagoon. And um, so a, as a way, uh, da Danielle's dad was my first deckhand on the first <laughs> commercial longline boat that I ran, and I, so I was gone for 10 years away from the Brevard County and away from the lagoon during the 1980s while I was um, long lining out, out in the ocean. And when I got back, I was appalled at what at the condition that the lagoon was in. And I'd only been gone 10 years, but there was a period of time from the late 70s to the, to the late 1980s where it, it really got bad really fast. And, and so I didn't know what to do when I, when I came back. I started working in the restaurant. I was horrified. And then um, I was invited to get on, serve on the board of the Audubon Society, <laughs> which opened a, a new door for me because um, I, I realized, you know, how, how, how environmentalists, how they cared about the lagoon, and they were just as angry as I was about its condition, but they were trying to do something about it. And so I'm really happy to be on this committee <coughs> instead of on the sidelines throwing rocks. So. Here I am. Yeah, Thank you. Rocks from the right. <laughs> bigger rocks, they give you bigger rocks. <laughs> Hi, uh, John Windsor. Um, I was appointed by the uh, League of Cities as a Lagoon Advocacy member. Um, I realized just this week that it's been 50 years, 5-0, since I've started taking water quality <coughs> measurements someplace. And uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, one of the reasons why I, I applied to this board uh, and why I've been um, uh, pretty, pretty concerned about the way we're moving forward is that uh, uh, scientists generally don't get involved in public or political processes. <clears throat> and uh, they find things perhaps not as clear cut or easy to understand. It's either yes or no answers, or your hypothesis tested or not tested, and there are gray areas of interpretation. And that information is often taken by the public um, or people who have other motives and used incorrectly. And so when, I, and, and I know Virginia can speak to this, as many of you can, if you try to get somebody to come out and speak to your group, um, scientists are somewhat reluctant to go out in public and talk. Some do, 
not many. So I thought it was really important that since I've been on the lagoon working at FIT for 38 years, um, that somebody who has a firm understanding of the history of science and the, uh, the, the ecosystem we're dealing with uh, be on this board. And uh, that's the reason why I applied. Uh, I, I find it difficult at times to express my concerns and opinions, my own personal feelings, because I'm always being tempered by that scientific training that I have. Uh, every once in a while, if you go back and look, I have gone and expressed my, my personal emotional feelings about things that are going on. But I think it's really important job that we have, and we have to keep moving forward and not get bogged down in uh, issues and just get the restoration going. We need to keep working on it. I did serve on the governor's task force on the Indian River Lagoon in 1983, 84, 85. There was a recognition in Florida at that time by the governor that there was a problem here. And there, were, there have been management plans in place we just haven't been strong enough in our men. They're there. People have been talking about these problems for 50 years. Um, and so, I, and I don't think people realize it. They think things just suddenly happen. It, it's not so. And, and, this, and solutions are available. They're all very costly. Thanks. I'll stop. <laughs> Uh, my name is Terry Casto, and I'm John's wingman as uh, advocate for the lagoon, uh, which I think is, for me, perhaps the 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 best position uh, because, like, well, I don't have John's scientific background, but but I can't talk, so we need, we need people we need people out there in the community that can talk cogently and coherently about the issues that we face and. Um, and what we need to do about it. <clears throat> 50 years seems to be the magic number. I've been here 50 years. Um, and I uh, spent a lot of time, as, as almost everybody did in those days, I was for 10 years or more single, and so boating and, and uh, water skiing, and I even scuba dived in the Indian River Lagoon, but it was pulling trash out along the causeways. I didn't scuba dive there for fun. We always went to the Keys for that. Um, but I was, you know, uh, I didn't think much about the lagoon. It was just something that, you know, you did. Uh, I remember seeing the crabbers in 85, you know, ripping up the bottom of the lagoon and thinking, you know, how can we have, I would drive across the Melbourne Causeway, there would be, you know, 50 boats out there. They would be gunnel to gunnel, and they're just, and, and even then I had the, the wit, I guess, to say that, you know, this probably, we need to get a handle on that. Um, but my, my passion for the lagoon ignited much later than many of, many of you. It was about 2013, and um, my wife and I went for a walk one morning, and we were crossing the, um, the Melbourne Causeway, and there, there are a ton of people down there, four or 5,000 people that are lined up, you know, crossing the causeway. And it was the hands across the causeway thing, and it was an awareness kind of thing. And so my wife and I end up on the top of the causeway, and uh, I get my photograph in the Today paper, uh, front, I mean, front and center. My wife didn't even make it. Her hand is in there. You can see her hand. That's it. My face and then two, two women who were not my wife that I had to explain to my friends. <laughs> But I started getting all these questions, you know, people, I, got, I got emails from people that I'd never heard of, never met before, who were asking me questions about the lagoon. I had no idea, you know, so much that I didn't know, right? So uh, my wife and I decided that, that we, would, uh, we would volunteer, and we would volunteer with the Marine Resources Council. So that's how I started, you know, uh, planting mangroves and drilling oyster shells and uh, build a bat house and build a little box and, you know, just volunteer kind of stuff. But I, st I started learning about what was then the four R's. They're now about ten R's, you know, the R's <laughs> keep expanding. But, uh, you know, that led to an interesting thing where I got interviewed by BBN, and, and, which is maybe not widely circulated, but a few people see it, and my face was on the front of that, right? As I, I started calling myself the face of the lagoon, right, because I'm showing up everywhere. Um, but um, the MRC has been a tremendous learning experience for me. Um, and I, it, it allowed me to meet a lot of people, Virginia, 
when the whole uh, tax initiative started, uh, meeting Mel and meeting Bo and meeting, I knew Vince Lamb from a long time ago. So, you know, meeting all these people that were, you know, had a lot more horsepower than I did, knew a lot more about the problems and were really out there, you know, pushing hard to, for changes. And so it just inspired me to try to, you know, pull my weight, do as much as I could. So I campaigned for the, for the, uh, for the tax initiative. I took signs down to the voting uh, booths and stood as close as I could legally, you know, and, <laughs> and, and encouraged people to get behind it. And, you know, it worked, you know. So it, it, it's proof that, that I think if people are given the right information, they will make the right decisions. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic. Um, as Dave about turning the corner on this, I think we have lots of challenges. Charlie and I were talking earlier about, you know, it's not just the Indian River Lagoon, it's the environment all across Florida. Um, and, um, and development isn't going away, and so we need uh, coherent uh, uh, policies in place to, to manage the development smartly, as, as John Treffrey is fond of saying, if we don't do something about the inflows, We'll be spending money on muck removal for the next, uh, you know, hundred years. So, um, I'm, I'm truly gratified that I was uh, uh, selected to be on this committee. I would say to the newcomers, um, you got a tough act to follow. You mentioned John Durkee, and he's one of my my heroes of this committee. But I tell you, every other one of these members as well. There have I'll, I'll step back from the table. All these other people. Are, I mean, to me, are like rock stars for the lagoon, right? Everybody comes with a passion, they come with knowledge, they come with, with um, good ideas, and they push hard for the right solution. So uh, good on you for joining the fight. Welcome to the team, and uh, I look forward to, you know, the next couple of years. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Courtney Barker. I am the, um, also the city manager for the city of Satellite Beach. And um, I was appointed for, as the finance expert, I guess, <laughs> um, representative for, and I was appointed by the League of Cities. Um, just some of my background, personally, I grew up in Satellite Beach on a canal, so I have um, been boating and playing in the canal since I was a child. And my uh, dad, after he retired from the military, he owned a boat dealership, so I have a lot of um, memories of boating on the Indian River Lagoon and playing at the Spoil Islands and playing with the manatees. Back then it was, it was okay, back then. <laughs> Not okay now, don't do that now. <laughs> um, but I, so personally I have a lot of, of emotional interest in, in seeing the lagoon restored. Um, professionally, I've, I've, my background is urban and regional planning. Um, I have a master's degree in that. Um, and I've been a planning director prior to being a city manager for, for many years. Um, so I've worked with um, Virginia for a while on a, you know, part of part of approving development is stormwater, and create. I've, I've had a lot of, um, I have a lot of background in putting together big stormwater projects and, you know, regulations and things like that. And so we've we've worked together for a long time on that um, end, and also, um, so so, I, you know, I was very much part of um, the putting together, not putting together the plan, but reviewing the plan. Um, helping the cities get the agreements together so that we would have the largest part, you know, a large pot of money instead of a bunch of little pots of money. Um, I worked with Mel, you know, way back when in, in creating, standing on the side of the road, you know, wearing the shirts. So, so this emotionally is um, my baby. Um, I, you know, I, that's, that's how I see it. I see this an effort as something that I want to see succeed. Um, uh, professionally, I, I'm very much like Mel, very much process oriented. I like to stick to the rules um, in the science, and um, so so you'll see that from me. And I, I'm very much honored to to be with all of you. Some of you I've worked with before on other committees. I think I've known Laura Lee for what 15 years now. <laughs> no, more than probably yeah, 20. probably 20. Yeah. yeah. So um, a lot of you I've, I've known in other capacities, and um, I appreciate you know, all the effort you put in, and, um, and I look forward to working with all the new members, so thanks. Hello, my name's Todd Swingle. I'm the finance alternate. Um, I guess I'm a newbie on a couple um, 
measures, not 50 yet. <laughs> and <laughs> I, and I've, John and I aren't 50 either. <laughs> <laughs> and I've only, um, I, I've, I moved to Brevard County in 2014. Um, but I do have the benefit also of being a Florida native and growing up on the water, just a different water body. I grew up in Okeechobee, spent all my time on Lake Okeechobee and the Kissimmee River, uh, which has had its own set of challenges um, that have been uh, looked at over the years. Um, uh, and my interest level it from, is from multiple points. Um, all of my career has been in water uh, at some level. Um, my education background, I have a bachelor's and master's in environmental engineering and also an MBA. Um, I've worked in local government, and I've worked as a consultant, and I've worked as industry. And I really, that's, I hope one of the things that I bring to the committee is kind of that balance between those sectors, because I'm a firm believer that it all has to work together. Um, we can't be so environmentally bent that we forget that we got to have a good sound economy that can pay for things, nor can we have such a focus on economy that gets so short-sighted that we forget about the impacts that we have that we've talked about that are going to take decades to manifest themselves. Um, I've seen the success of local government and the fact that um, that you at least you have a room full of people and it's not, you know, it, it's, it's where things happen big believer in that and I will say that that's one of the things we need to continue to focus on is our legislative um, uh, priorities to make sure that local government stays in as much control as possible because we need to be able to do what's right for us locally. Um, and the other thing is that you know having worked in industry I've had the I've been fortunate to work globally and see both the uh, challenges that exist and the successes that can come forward when, when we do get aligned between environmental interests and business. Um, I've traveled extensively and seen water supply and water quality challenges in India and China and, you know, stuff that is just you don't want to have to see. But I've seen businesses step up and, and really get aligned with those long-term interests. And for me, that's, that's where my interest really lies is, how do we strike that right balance between making sure that um, that we're all in this together and that we understand that, because um, I, I think you go talk to any business and there's not going to be a debate that, that we want to see the lagoon restored, but, but how we get there is challenging. And it does take a lot of money and we need to keep the economy going and we need to keep our focus on the end point for environment. So that's really where my interest lies is at that that, that fringe and uh, in between those those interests and you know I hope I can kind of walk in both areas and, and bring that piece to the group. Okay. Brandon Smith, I work for Brevard County Natural Resources as an environmental specialist on the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Flip program. I manage the contracts with the cities for their projects and I also am involved with the communication on both our social media and our website and anything else they decide to throw at me. <laughs> and then uh, before that, I worked for 14 years as the manager of a marine science center for the county at Riverwalk Park in Rockledge. So I take groups out on the lagoon, do seining, and I definitely saw the decline in just those 14 years on what we'd pull up in our seine nets and what we saw out there. So it's definitely something that's close to my heart, and I want to help as much as I can. Um, I, I, as you were going around the table, I was debating whether I should say anything <laughs> as staff or not. Um, but I, I'm a Florida native and uh, grew up on the St. John's River, um, skiing and, and fishing and, and playing and, and watched that um, uh, degrade over time. And, and I got my undergraduate degree in biology and math. Um, my first job was in the Florida Keys uh, as a research diver, and um, then I ended up working on developing the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Plan, um, which was just a fascinating process, the whole, bringing everybody together, all the different agencies, all the different interest groups, trying to figure out what do we need to do for the Florida Keys and how are we going to do it. 
Um, and so through that two-year planning experience, was, this is what I want to do. I went back to, um, to school to get a master's degree in coastal environmental management. Um, for my master's thesis, I went to Sri Lanka and worked on developing a plan for their first national marine sanctuary. And then I ended up here. Um, and so uh, I didn't choose uh, to be sitting at this table, um, but I, I am I'm very pleased to be here um, and, and excited to have an opportunity to take the skill sets that I've developed over time and put them towards uh, this purpose, which I very strongly believe in. Virginia, was there any other staff here you wanted to introduce? Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, so you guys want to... Oh. Yeah, just line up. So <laughs> where's the crystal? I'm Anthony Gubler. I uh, spearhead the sewer and septic sections, and again, anything that's thrown our way. And I have an undergrad in oceanography and a master's in environmental management, and grew up playing you know, on the river, on my little section on Indian Atlantic. So me and my friends all went to school so we can do exactly this. Yeah, and I'm proud to be here to help. My name is Walker Dawson. Um, I'm also with the Save Our Lagoon program. Um, I'm, I, I guess I, I spearhead the, the muck removal projects. My background is, well, I, I used to be a coastal engineer. I did a lot of beach work. Now that I'm doing this environmental dredging work, I'm not quite sure what box I fit into in terms of an engineer, but I am an engineer. Um, my background, I have an undergrad in ocean engineering from Florida Tech. Um, I've been in Brevard County since 1982. Um, I graduated from Cocoa Beach High in 1996, and from the early 90s through, you know, mid-2000s, um, I caught obscene numbers of redfish and black drum. You know, my honey hole was always the no-motor zone, and anyone who knows the north, north banana knows that area was like the mecca for big redfish and big drum, and now it's, it's like a, a barren wasteland. There's no seagrass. Um, I haven't even tried to go up there. I'm, I'm afraid I'll be depressed of it. But, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of this team, and um, whatever path we need to take as a team to get there, you know, it, it has my full support. My name is Courtney Meyer. I'm the stormwater engineer. Um, I was born and raised in Titusville. I live in Merritt Island now. My dad's family, they were born and raised in Satellite Beach, so I'm from here, love it here, don't want to be anywhere else. Um, I got a civil engineering degree at FIT, had no idea I would be able to use it for this, but now I can help my home, and I love that. I'm Crystal Melton. I'm the fiscal analyst for the Save Our Indian River Lagoon program. Um, I'm a Florida native. I've been born and raised in Titusville, raising my family in Titusville. Um, I started out at the clerk's office, and I was there for a good 12 years, and I was picked up by Natural Resources, and I'm very honored and blessed to be here. And um, I remember in grade school, one of my big first science projects that had to do with the lagoon. My mother and I were talking about it the other day, getting horseshoe crabs and, and figuring out what pollutants were going into the lagoon and why things were, were dead around the lagoon. And so ironically enough, here I am, and uh, I'm very honored to be here, and hopefully I'll serve you well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's nice to hear everybody's personal stories. Um, and I learned quite a bit in the last few minutes that I did some things I didn't know about you guys. Danielle, I had no idea your family history on the water and, and uh, commercial uh, fishing. And Virginia majoring in math, that answers a lot of questions that I had. <laughs> <laughs> so that makes perfect sense. Um, so, um, all right, let's go ahead and get the, um, the, uh, the business uh, going here. Uh, we have, uh, we need a motion to approve the agenda. Anyone? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then we have the approval of the minutes. We need a motion for that as well. So moved. Second. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, so we have um, another task before us right now. Um, I'm not sure the process behind it, but I know I'm losing my title. So um, I don't know, Virginia, if there's um, a process we need to do, but we're looking for a new chair and a new vice um, to lead this committee uh, going forward, I guess as soon as they're, as soon as they're voted in. Can we just move the vice in and then uh, do another vice? Wait. Isn't that Wait, what? It's pretty traditional. <laughs> Stop. Chair. Chair. Can <laughs> Stop the presses. You need to make the nomination. That's a pretty <laughs> traditional approach. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gordon, explain, <laughs> explain your proposal again. To nominate the vice chair into the chair position and nominate. It's not what we did last year. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're doing such a great job and you're demonstrating how well you're doing that it's. And you don't have to move seats. And you don't have to move seats. You can just stay right there, right? It's important. Efficiency. It's efficient. <laughs> <laughs> You talked about being surprised this morning, David. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually not it's what I was expecting this morning. <laughs> yes. It really is. Um, of course, I'll serve if if asked of me. That's why I'm here. But I don't. Again, if that's that's up to you guys. I'm, I'm not nominating myself. Uh, if I can make a comment for the public and for people who are new to this process, and I know we're going to talk about sunshine later, but none of us can talk outside this meeting about things that may come before the meeting. But I had exactly the same thought. It seems to work at the county commission level and other places, yeah. and it gives some continuity and some sense of, you know, if David's willing, I, I would be glad to nominate him as, <laughs> uh, as the chair. And I'll second that. <laughs> and, oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> do you want to take nominations for vice chair at this point? Because I would like to nominate I, I you, John. What, I don't know what the process sure. is. Because uh, we haven't done this yeah. before. This yeah, is yeah. so. Um, there's a motion. There's a motion. The motion so there's a, there's a motion on the floor. Oh, right. So are there any other. And is that the way you do that? I have a question. Because usually uh, the rules that I've read, you nominate someone and then we vote rather than a motion. Right. You have a motion on the floor, so you want to vote for that first. Um, there's no set policy that the vice chair from the previous year graduates to the chair position. That is simply the will of the, the board. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so if you want to take the motion so or if you want to call for anybody else who wants to volunteer, that's also an option. I, I need a clarification. Um, do the alternates vote or are we just, we're, we make comments but we don't vote. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, correct. Thank you. You vote when your member is not present. Okay. So we have a motion that's been seconded that David Lane uh, ascend from vice chair to chair. <laughs> is there any further discussion on that? So I suppose there's going to be a vote. <laughs> All opposed? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. <clears throat> I guess I'm sitting here for the rest of the meeting. Um, all right, so I guess at this time, <clears throat> um, I don't know what protocol is for the, for the vice chair appointment. Um, I used to hold that role uh, moments ago. Um, I don't know if, if I nominate somebody. Um, if I were to make a motion to nominate somebody, <clears throat> um, I have a vendetta. Um, Courtney, um, I would nominate Courtney to be the vice chair of the committee. And um, I would like to hear a second and a third and a fourth. <laughs> I second. I think, Christina, I think that's the way nominations are working. You don't. I don't. Just Please. Order. Just a point. Please. Point of order. I mean, so you do nominations. My understanding is we have a nomination. The floor is open. Are there any other nominations? Mm -hmm. right. Once not the nominations motion. have been named, mm -hmm. then we vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, not, it's a not a motion. Is there? Second. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to volunteer themselves or no nominate somebody else? For the vice chair, I position. attempted to uh, nominate John Windsor if he's willing to serve as vice chair. I can, but I also had a thought in mind about that I didn't communicate with anybody else because we can't talk outside this room. Uh, maybe one of the new members should be put in as the vice chair um, to prepare them for being chair next time. Yeah. I agree with that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm okay you do. either way. 
Well, well now we, we only have one. I think we only have one town member that's actually a voting member. Or an alternate can be a vice chair. Can you need a, a member to be a vice chair, to be an officer. So, so that would be John Lesnar. How, how is Vinny not... <laughs> I think the signs are reversed. That, no. 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 That, no. That's, I thought you that's automatically what the county rolled. Nope. The, that's what the county commission did. Okay. <laughs> I did not. I just found out. So, <laughs> so we, have, we have two nominations right now for vice chair, but it seemed to be that there was <clears throat> some interest in nominating a newbie to vice chair. <clears throat> and as I look around the room, our only possible option is John for that position. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, that makes it easy. <laughs> John, do you have any thoughts about being the vice chair? <clears throat> being being <clears throat> so new, I mean, I it's because I don't know how this whole. You know, when I'm not here, goes. you're taking over. <laughs> oh, I hope, yeah. Just I hope yeah. I usually I'm usually not here about twice to go fishing. Okay. It, it's not that hard. Yeah. We'll, we'll That's not that okay. yeah. You'll see how it works a couple meetings. I'm fine with it then. Is there any other discussion? around the table about the vice chair appointment? Terry, did you want to say something? Well, I'm just, me personally, I think it's perhaps unfair to the quote newbies, right, mm -hmm. to, to be thrown into that before they even have a chance to, you know, sort of calibrate the organization. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. But I, I think right now we have three nominations, mm -hmm. right? We have Courtney, Courtney, Courtney John, and John, and John, and John, John, and John. So mm -hmm. that, I have, I have nothing more to add. I mean, I guess <laughs> I, I, the thought that I had is, is we're going to do this again next year, right? The yeah. terms are one year. The terms are two, one, year. one year. One year. One year. One year. Chairs, one year. At members, two years. Right, but so the chair. So if we didn't have a newbie this year, that would give the newbie, i.e., you, because you're the only a member, of a year of experience. Mm -hmm. So you're the vice vice chair. I'm the vice vice chair. Yeah. I like that. That makes sense to me. We can I do would, a pipeline I wouldn't want to be thrown people. into the fire. <laughs> yeah, having. Well, just I'm used met to everyone. it working with BRPH. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Throwing it in the fire. <laughs> well, I think Dr. Windsor would be a great vice chair. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think he, I agree too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would vote for him, of course. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I nominated him. Does anybody else have anything to say about? Um, if we are moving back towards, if we're removing John, uh, the, the uh, tech, new technology member, from consideration, we're back to John, Windsor, and Courtney. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Any suggestions? Christine? I'm sorry? At some point, there will be a motion. Yes. Yep. I motion to vote. Okay. Do we have a second to vote? Second? What, what is what the motion? Is The motion is to vote for the vice chair. Vice chair. And our two, of, three. among our, among our, all three. Among all three. Okay. Yeah, three motions, right? Yeah, there's three motions. Do we have a second for that motion? Second. Any discussion? Any opposed? Well, I guess that motion passes. We're going to have a vote. I don't know the procedure for the vote. There needs to be a motion to nominate one person, and you will vote. Oh, on we that haven't one had that. Person. Do we have a motion to nominate anybody yet? Yeah. If I can make a motion, I might. <laughs> I make a motion to nominate John Windsor as vice chair. Uh, as vice chair. Okay, I'll second it. <laughs> no, I had to There's motion to different end way to yeah. So we have a motion to nominate John Windsor for to be put on the ballot. No, to vote. To vote. No, to, vote. to be so oh. take the chair. Yeah. To be vice chair. Oh, you're, we're voting for, you're, we have a motion to John appoint John vice chair of the committee. Yes. Okay, and we have a second? Yep, second. Good. <laughs> should we, should there be another motion at this point for any other nominations? No. Yeah, if, if there, if it, if it dies, then you can go to All right, so we're going to vote <laughs> right now to appoint John Windsor the vice chair. Correct. Remember, we have a motion. Voting have a motion. has consequences. <laughs> we have a second. It's not voting. So, all in favor of appointing John Windsor, Aye. vice chair of the committee. Aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? 
Well, I guess the motion passes. John, congratulations. Thank you. All right. Good job, John. Sorry. I don't know how Courtney Skate is in this process. <laughs> It goes, it, goes to her, it goes to her <laughs> legislative skills here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess that's settled. We can move on. All right, so um, monthly progress reports, Virginia. Thank you. All right, and I will try to keep this brief. Um, certainly the, a, a lot of activity this month working with the county commission um, and especially uh, Commissioner uh, Lober's office on his agenda to um, pass uh, the majority of the plan that you recommended and so you have the clerk's memo um, with the, the board action on that and we'll discuss it uh, later in your agenda um, also included in that action was moving ahead with funding for th the three uh, highest priority outreach education and engagement um, uh, campaigns that you had previously recommended and we have contracted with the firm for that and we've had a kickoff meeting and so uh, we're looking forward to getting started on those campaigns uh, quickly. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, the, the fifth bullet down, the Grand Canal muck dredging project, the, the bid opening uh, was delayed another week um, to 3-18, uh, March 18th. Um, due to both bidder requests and um, the permitting agencies have uh, contacted us about wanting to change some of the permitting conditions and um, we are trying to not have that happen um, while we're in the middle of bidding but we certainly can't close bids and then have potential change orders to address that so um, we're, we're working uh, very diligently to try to resolve those issues so we can. I just have a quick question. What is the, I, I, I know what it is, but for the public, the, they changed from a three month manatee season to a six month? Is that seven correct? months. Seven months. Seven month closure so seven for month dredging. Seven month closure out of the year, we couldn't dredge, which is, you know, but everybody else can both. Around. And <laughs> yes. March 27th. March 27th. It's sliding between conversations. It was March 12th, then it bumped to 20th, then it went to March 27th. <clears throat> Thank you for that correction. Okay, March 27th. Um, the good news is that the O'Galley muck dredging project is fully permitted. Could I, could I make a comment? Uh, the BV-52 for some of the folks who are new or maybe even some of the other. What's a BV-52? That is the Florida Inland Navigation District's dredge spoil management area that we used for the Turkey Creek project that we leased from them and used for the Turkey Creek project. They are currently making improvements on that facility right now, and as soon as those improvements are done, we'll be able to bid out the O'Galley project. Um, uh, Matt Culver is busy removing derelict vessels. Uh, funding came through and, and vessels are being pulled out from, from the water. Um, that's a very long, arduous process, uh, working with the state to get those vessels a research, to contact the owners, to provide them the proper notice and allow them time to come get their, fetch their vessel. Um, and eventually it gets declared derelict by the state, at which point we can pursue grant funds to pull them out. Um, uh, we have a lot of videos to share with you on progress, so I hope we will actually have time um, for some of those t later today. Um, missing from this list is uh, uh, last month um, you made a motion to uh, make a recommendation to the county commission that they encourage DOT to consider elevating the 528 causeway over the lagoon. Um, that went to the county commission. They um, recommended the same thing. So a letter has been uh, drafted for DOT and it's currently in review. Um, and I'll get you a copy of that letter as soon as it goes out the door. Um, <clears throat> one of the videos that we have uh, is of the Titusville um, South Street baffle box project under under construction um, watching that baffle box get lowered in the hole um, so that they're they're still you know doing the finishing touches on that project but um, exciting construction 
Um, down, way down the list, the, the Grand Canal muck dredging project, uh, we just mailed out, I think it was 840 waiver letters uh, to folks that live alongside that project that um, if they sign those waivers, we would be allowed to get within five feet of their uh, seawalls um, to remove muck instead of the standard setback of, of 10 feet. So we'd be able to get a lot more muck out of that system. What if they don't? Then, then we do the standard 10 foot setback. And that's property by property? Property by property. Yeah, thank you. Um, the four continuous water quality monitoring stations, um, we are, we've uh, signed, the county has signed that contract and it's been sent to, to ORCA and uh, we had a meeting, we've selected our sites um, and so we're looking forward to getting those uh, continuous monitoring stations installed in the lagoon. Um, and we are, uh, I am working with Eddie Fontenon, the new utilities director, on a board workshop on the lagoon. It'll be on the lagoon um, plan and on utilities. And um, it is uh, coming up on April 18th. The, the back side of your sheet the, is un, listed under the last presentation this month. It says April 16th. That's wrong. It's April 18th. Okay. Can I it's at one? one? Thursday, April 18th at 1 p.m. If, if multiple members of this board go to that meeting, is there anything we need to do other than just keep our mouths shut? Or um, If you would like us to advertise yeah. that um, so that you can all be there and speak freely, we would appreciate it. It will be, you know, it'll be a publicly noticed meeting. There will be minutes. Do you need, um, so a, mo would, do you need a motion for that? That, that, that would be great. I would make a motion to uh, advertise this meeting so we can attend it. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, second. <laughs> Any opposed? Or all in favor? Aye, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, John, you're going to be there? Yes, sir. Are you, are you intending to speak? I'm not intending at this point to speak. <laughs> You'll be there too? I'll be there and I'll have a really hard time not speaking, so okay. I'm probably going to speak. <laughs> you know me. Um, other that's okay. Everyone can speak as long as it's advertised. Uh, absolutely. I was just yeah. curious to know who was yeah. going. That's yeah. all. Okay. And I'll be going too. Me too. You all, at, at your last meeting, you had asked for a joint workshop. Um, you know, this is the workshop on the lagoon that's already on the county commission's agenda. So attending this workshop may be your best vehicle for having that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Wait, can you say the date one more time? 18. 18. April 18, <laughs> 1 p.m. in this room. So is that the answer was to go to this? From the commission, um, I, I actually talked to Virginia about this, and I, I she did mention that there was a workshop on the 18th. And I know how busy the county commission is, and I, I, I had talked to her after and said, Why don't we just do the uh, see about the workshop? No, I agree, I think that just going to this would be easier for everybody, so. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Time I just push. didn't know if you were going to try to do another one, so I, one, okay. one so this p.m. in this room. <laughs> On the 18th. Okay. On the April 18th. Thank you. And and then and this is really more for new members, but um, old um, existing members can weigh in. the The future topics for special presentations at the bottom. Um, you know, as you all have ideas and and um, interests in specific <coughs> topics, uh, whether that's communicated in these meetings or. Um, uh, between directly between meetings, I've tried to keep a running tally of those. And so, uh, if there are specific things that you want added to that tally, um, then we try to think about time of the year and, and lining up speakers and who's available when um, to to make these things happen. Are you taking suggestions now? Oh, anytime. That's, that's what I was going to do. <laughs> 
if anybody wants to throw something out, please do. Uh, yeah, um, I'd be interested in more information or, you know, some presentation on mosquito control and how that might impact the lagoon and its ecology. Are you, um, Lorraine, are you referencing like the, the impoundments and the, and the dikes and the water flow? Well, um, in Coco, you know, we recently, and I guess as standard practice, received a letter um, from the county mosquito control, you know, asking for our permission to spray. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've had a number of constituents approach me, you know, wondering how does that impact the, the lagoon? And I have no idea. Oh, I would idea. assume that... We have a lot of impoundments, and I just caught yeah. a 35-inch redfish in one last weekend. Yeah. So it's exciting. And, and, you know, Brevard County manages more impoundments than anywhere else. Um, uh, I think it's 30-something thousand mm -hmm. acres of impoundments and using water levels to control mosquito levels yeah. so that uh, we minimize the amount of chemicals mm -hmm. that are that are needed but certainly mm -hmm. we can we can talk about idea. that and then you know we always uh, prefer biorational products rather than mm -hmm. yeah I don't know you guys but I absolutely love our speaker circuit that we have yeah I, mm -hmm. I find it fascinating I would pay to enter yeah. yeah that's how impressed I am by it and and I had well, our city went through the mosquito questions too mm -hmm. and we had and I think you know, they do a great job, so I think it would be a good time for them to shine, honestly, because we, they do so much to try to minimize the level of, you know, toxicity in, in controlling mosquitoes in our county, and I think they do a really, really good job in doing that. Um, I had a, I had a, last meeting, I think we talked about getting the scientists in that, that talked to the county commission, and I don't know if that's something, I don't know if you want to add them to like a panel or something, but I think we need to have that side in to talk to us, um, and I and I think that would be a good way to get us rounded in what the county commission's hearing, so we understand where that all is coming from. So I don't know if anybody else has that um, desire to see that, Definitely. but I think that's something yeah. we need to do. The sooner the better, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Is that something like item number one under future topics for special presentation? It could it's, fall under there. It seems like that's the... Okay. Whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> However you want to handle it. Nutrient cycling. Mm -hmm. that we could. Yeah, nutrient cycling or... Close I mean, all nutrient all sources and cycling. Yes, and so that would be great. But not, but not just agency and university people, but open to... But you can't have an infinite number, so... I, I don't know how to handle that. I would just let staff put together just people that we really haven't heard from. We That's can what contact the commissioners yeah. and find out who okay. has contacted their That'd offices and get their contact information and who would be interested. Great. That'd be perfect. Yeah. Okay, and great. Virginia, I know you guys are doing research on uh, package plants, mm -hmm. and I know you're going to bring that back to us, but should that be listed as a future topic, or I know, I know it's coming back anyways? Uh -huh. I, I know I, I learned last meeting that it's not a packaging plant. It's a package <laughs> plant, um, so I would like, uh, I don't know, so I, I, I just didn't know if that should go under uh, future topics. Mm -hmm. Virginia. We'll, we'll look back. I, um, I was talking to a home inspector that does scopes on lateral lines, mm -hmm. and he was referring all of his home inspections out to um, plumbers for their, their scoping, and he started doing it himself because 90% of his referrals were failing lateral inspections, and he thought that the plumbers were failing it so that they could have work. And so he started doing them himself and has a lot of recent field experience scoping lateral lines, and I thought that would be something interesting to investigate. Mm -hmm. Has he found, really good has he found a, a discrepancy in those numbers? Because I know, not to channel the dirty over there, but one of the things that <laughs> he was so adamant about was our, our numbers from our smoke test, and mm -hmm. I, I would be really interested to see. So I, I think it would be great to get the information on who he was referring it out to, if they're still having that high of a percentage of failed lateral line inspections, and then um, getting some feedback from him, and maybe that's a discussion prior to it coming to the committee for you to talk to him. I don't know. But it was interesting, and I just came up on it. Those are great ideas yeah. all. I would... I would highly recommend anybody, if you have an idea, um, I guess they would email you, Virginia? Yep, or call. Or call. I know I've done that a couple of times myself on ideas. Um, 
So please do that if you guys come up with anything. Um, moving forward, um, Walker, before, we, excuse me, uh, before you continue, sure. uh, just an excess of caution, I believe on the Johns Road Flounder Creek uh, work underway, I think I leased a piece of land to the dredging company that did that. <clears throat> I think it was that one. Um, uh, up it said in Mims. I believe that's in Mims. Yes. Yeah, I think I leased a piece of land and just in the past it's all done, but just as a disclosure. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's all. Yeah, those are stormwater. These here are stormwater projects, not the. Oh, it's the, not the dredging. Not, not the dredging. Never mind then. Um, no but problem. I know we are doing <laughs> some easement. I thought it was dredging. Work in the ditch. But that's a good thing to disclose, though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Been here, done that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You have your. Uh, beautiful green tables that Brandon puts together every month with progress. If you have any questions for Brandon on, on those. And you have your uh, finance graphs and tables uh, put together by Crystal. We have, told, we have collected just over $90 million so far since the inception of the tax. I just the question on the reds. I know there's only those <coughs> two reds, and I know I think those were stormwater projects, right? Yeah, that, that was one they were uh, waiting on easements. They yeah. had some difficulty with. They were going to try one more round, and I guess this year see if they can get them. And if not, they'll withdraw them the following we'll year. Withdraw the project. Okay. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> it's hard to get easements for swales. Because nobody wants this whale. Yeah. It is. It's a tough thing to do. So I, I just have to say I feel for him. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough job. Question, Virginia. Is there a way we can notice an orientation meeting for some of the newer members uh, who would like to understand exactly what we're looking at? <laughs> and and a, a Q and a so we can mm -hmm. really digest all of this when <coughs> we're handed these charts? And I'd attend too. So maybe that needs to be a presentation topic. What? Well, could we do it outside? I don't. I don't know if it would be best outside the meeting, just because our meetings are so packed as right. as it is. I know maybe room is limited. Can it be a webcast? I mean, it's going to have to that be everybody could noticed. attend. To have more than one of you in the room, right? It's going to have to be a publicly right. noticed. Meeting, yeah. so whether we can I make a suggestion? Do a special meeting? I think you should just call the staff and make an appointment. I was going to do it. that, but yeah. I didn't know if for the staff's yeah, time, that's a lot of separate <coughs> times four plus right. 14 people lined up at the door. Yeah, but well, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I call I Virginia all the time. So I see, su <laughs> I suggest we, we pick a date and add an hour to outside the normal business agenda. I mean, if we spend more than an hour on it, we're flogging the pony. So, you know, <laughs> let's 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 do something like that. I think I think we flogging need the, flogging a the get together. I, nobody heard you after you said flogging. I know. The pony. <laughs> <laughs> I could have I tuned it down. You know, I think an hour. I think an hour would understand, but okay. I think an hour after one of our regularly scheduled meetings would be good because we're here. Yeah. We've already committed the time. Wow. Don't make a special trip. Uh, could bring in lunch. Oh, Here, if you can, be public. Yeah, if you could email whatever questions you might have, so we can make sure to address those in the orientation, would be great. So we would probably want to schedule that for next month. I'm thinking. If, yeah, if you can get your questions to me or Brandon, you know, in the next week or two, so we have time to. Does adding an hour of special extra special presentation require a motion? Um, and we, we need would be to a, extend the meeting time, and we'll need to check on the availability of the room. So if we can do it for next month, we will. If we have to schedule it further out because of room availability. Um, but I, I don't think we need a motion for that. Okay. If we did, we could always do it at that time. I have okay. a question. Um, I know we discussed going to every other month. Was that thrown off the table? Yeah. Okay. Correct. The, the final motion was to change the bylaws from monthly meetings to regular meetings. Um, 
and keep up at the monthly pace until we think that's no longer necessary, if that ever happens. <laughs> I think we did. We approved the year date of the meeting is what we, we did. The June <coughs> month yeah. off. Yeah. And For the rest of the year. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we did June. That was nice. <laughs> I have to do a budget. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else to discuss on the performance table? Okay, moving forward, we have a revenue graph and financial statement. Comment? I'm including that all in the same table, I guess. Were there any comments or questions on that subject? So it looks like we're moving forward to special presentations. Uh, we have to have a review of the Florida Sunshine Law. Christine? Yes. Um, <coughs> since we have four new members, Virginia asked me just to do a refresher. Um, I know I've worked with Laura Lee Thompson on other advisory committees, so I know she's very knowledgeable. And it sounds like, Dennis, you may have experience on boards as well. Um, so I will go through this. If this it can be a fluid conversation. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask in the meeting. Or if you think of it after the meeting, send me an email or a phone call as well. My number is at the top right-hand corner of this memo that um, Carol handed out this morning. So as an advisory board to the Board of County Commissioners, you are all subject to sunshine law. We've already discussed and acknowledged that you cannot talk about COC business outside an advertised public meeting. You're also subject to the Florida Code of Ethics, and in particular, um, for you, that's the voting requirements, and we'll discuss that, and the Florida Public Records Act. The key points to be mindful about um, public meeting laws is that they must be open to the public, we have to provide advance notice of when the meeting will take place, and minutes are taken, and at the end you'll have an opportunity for public comment. You'll also want to provide an opportunity for public comment whenever you're having a discussion on um, a motion to, for business items, such as approving the annual update. You will take public comment before a motion from the COC is made. And as discussed, a meeting is a conversation or meeting um, of any two members outside of an advertised meeting. That can include phone calls, emails, um, and social media. Um, not just this committee, but the rest of Florida has had to adjust to social media and public records laws, and it can be a bit tricky. Um, so, you can comment to other COC members. No, you cannot comment, <laughs> share, or like even um, COC comments about business. You can read it, um, and that's about it. Otherwise, you're engaging in a discussion, and that would be a problem with sunshine laws. If you see something on the internet that you think would be helpful to disseminate to the public, that's in general reference to um, environmental issues about the lagoon, please send it to Brandon. He moderates the, the official county lagoon websites and he can disseminate that on, on your behalf. So please don't even share um, messages and posts from other COC members. It's, it's just best to avoid it. Um, the law has not quite caught up with, with social media and, and the nuances that presents for public records laws. So you, you, you just want to avoid it. Um, one exception to meeting outside um, an advertised public meeting is that the COC member and the alternate for that seat, since they are one vote on the committee, they can have discussions outside of the public meeting. Another exception, and we did this last year, I believe, is inspection trips. If there, um, there may be a speaker that has um, a business somewhere that you may want to go observe, and we did this with FOA. Um, for septic systems and alternative ways of managing septic. Um, you can have a group outing. You're just not going to be discussing COC business on that outing. <coughs> Moving on to voting in the Florida Code of Ethics. You will be required to vote on any 
item that comes before the COC, except for an item where you have a financial conflict of interest. <coughs> so if you have um, something about a motion would create a special financial private gain to you, your family, or your business, um, you will need to disclose that. There is a form that will be provided by staff that we will file with the state. Yes, Danielle. I'm curious, since we're one vote, if he has something that he couldn't vote on, am I allowed to? Well, he can vote. Yes. Yeah, the primary. Yes, so if Just he... Just making sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if he has to recuse himself, then you can take the vote as the alternate. <clears throat> Well, he's well, the alternate. I'm the primary. The vice I just person. wanted right. to know if anything that he does affects me as well. No. Okay. No, you wouldn't knock out your vote. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, moving on to public records. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, and any paper that we generate that's. Um, made or received in connection with official business is public record. Um, where that gets tricky is electronic records. Those also fall into the Florida public records law. So all your emails, your texts, your social media posts about COC business are public records. The county has a software company called Social Media. And um, it maintains records of all the official county websites regarding COC and, and any other um, topic. So you don't have to worry about retaining any information that you post on those websites. Um, and you don't have to worry about any emails you send to county staff. They will be retained by county staff. If you're sending emails that um, don't involve county staff, those will still be public records and you could either maintain those yourself or send them to county staff for retention. <coughs> That's what I would do, just kind of get it off my hands. Um, regarding emails, it doesn't matter if you send it from your personal computer or private phone. It's all about the content of the information. Um, what many members do who serve on advisory boards is they create a special email address for that use only. That way you don't get mixed up with what's your personal email and your, your business COC email. Texts, a county has a policy for staff not to use texts at all. We just don't have a, a, a way to capture texts. What we have to do if we send a text about business is screenshot that and email it to ourselves. I find that very cumbersome, so I don't text myself and I, I don't accept texts for business. Um, again, there's just no good way to deal with texts in, in Florida public records law. So my suggestion is to avoid that form of communication about COC business. So communicating outside of this meeting, um, you can talk about anything but COC business. Um, all your discussions, and you've done a very good job of that today, being very informal about your questions regarding voting for, for new officers and meeting, just save it for, for the meeting. And it, it's a pretty open dialogue here every month and, and you don't want to even create the perception of causing a, a Sunshine Law violation. So if you do, there are big consequences. Um, I haven't seen consequences either with county boards or boards across the state. With advi at the advisory level, but there can be fines, jail time, and payment of attorney's fees and costs for violating Sunshine Law and public records law. Um, so if there is any question, please do not hesitate to contact staff or contact me. Uh, members have done that in the past, and it's fairly easy to resolve quickly, and um, we don't want anybody worrying about fines, jail time, or attorney's mm -hmm. fees. So. I included a reference at the bottom of the memo. The Florida Attorney General's Office publishes every year a very handy manual. It's called the Government in the Sunshine Manual. It's available online, and that link is at the bottom if you want to peruse it, answer any questions if you can't reach me quickly. 
Are there any questions for me? Yeah, uh, just to clarify, I just want to hear it one more time. So we have the right as members to write editorials. Correct. To post to a social media our opinions. Correct. Or to speak in a, in a meeting where other members aren't present. Correct. The key is to not have a back and forth discussion. Mm -hmm. So let's say um, there wasn't an advertisement of the COC meeting at the workshop coming up in April. Any COC member who stood up to speak would speak only to the Board of County Commissioners. You would not comment on another prior COC member's statement. Um, and on social media, you can read your, your joint member's motions or po posts, but you're not to respond in any way. Mm -hmm. It's that back and forth discussion that is the trigger for a violation. I think the disclosure forms too, aren't there financial disclosure forms that we had to do? Yes. Annually, those will be available from Carol at some point. I don't, we'll, we'll look at what time we did that last okay. year. I just didn't know if the new members, if it comes around <laughs> once a year and then that's when they get it or if they do it right. now. I know for me it was good to have a heads up, so I just wanted to give them a heads up in case you need your accounts or anything to gather all your numbers. Yeah, you don't have to report your numbers. You have it's the short form oh. for you all. <laughs> What accounts you have? I, I just, the value uh, of those I just want to make. I always make mm -hmm. sure I'm, I'm as transparent as possible. So I just give it to. Please take care of this. <laughs> I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> can, can I make a quick comment? Uh, whenever I speak, either to the county commission or any place else, I always say I'm a member of the COC, but I'm not representing the COC at the meeting. And to my recollection, we haven't had any motions here in the history of this committee where we've authorized an individual to go from COC to the county commission to give a presentation and say they represent the county commission. So if in the future, if we want somebody from this committee to do that, we need to do that at one of these meetings. I just want to bring that, make that very clear. Okay? Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes people in the public get up and speak before the county commission and they say COC says this and COC says that. And the county commission thinks that maybe those people are COC members and have, they've actually muddied the water in understanding of the, some of the commissioners, I think. And so I think we need to be real careful about how we as individuals uh, approach the board of county commissioners or any other group we talk to. Can, can I motion to let John say that he's there on behalf of the COC? <laughs> Well, see, the times I've gone to the COC to talk, there's, there's things that have come up since our last meeting where there's been no chance to discuss that item. And so I would feel very uncomfortable saying I'd be speaking on behalf of the COC unless we actually talked about that item. Yeah. I think if there's an item, like John said, an individual item that we wanted him to talk to from the board, but I wouldn't want to motion him at all times because that may tie his hands whenever he wanted to speak on his own personal behalf. Well, okay. I just get up and say, Vinny told me to say this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my nephew, you wouldn't be the first. My you nephew, you, Vinny. You wouldn't be the first, Uncle John. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have a request on emails, and I think a lot of this is already occurring with staff, but any staff emails that go out, I'd just ask, please use the BCC function rather than the CC function. Mm -hmm. It just makes it less likely that people are going to reply all. Right. And that's, that's why you don't see each other's emails in, in stuff that goes out from us. Is yeah, and I, I think it's, the, the, I think it's happened time. most of the time. There's, I've seen a few, <coughs> but instead of that, just kind of reiterate that. And also, for all the members, the safest bet is never reply all. So, um, just. Christine. Um, you mentioned that content can trigger the nature of uh, create some create a public record. Can you explain how that applies to social media? If the message is related to COC business and you're posting it as a <coughs> member, okay. So I would have to declare this is on behalf of the COC at the time, or if you're posting as a member and you're talking about business that could foreseeably come or will come before the COC. That is a message that no other COC member could <coughs> respond to. Right, but do we have a duty to screenshot it is my question. And report it. Mm -hmm. If it's not on the county maintained social media, so anything you may, that you, might you want to keep a to record of that. Lagoon anything 
Oh, that's mm-hmm. a big nexus. She doesn't have to declare that she's a COC member. No. It just kind of in, it's implied no, but or? Because, but she, by, is. because yeah. she is. Yes. <laughs> Mel. So you just need to keep. <laughs> I would just request, I, I would recommend a screen recorder and just let it run all day long. <laughs> and then just save those files. And if somebody, uh, serious, and if somebody wants that, you just give them. You can set it to record applications. So let's say you had a Chrome or whatever your browser is. Mm -hmm. You would say record this application. And if you're on social media, that's what I recommend. Because screenshotting and making sure everything is good and then keeping it all together, you can just do screen records and there's free software. That's up to you. I don't know what that is yet. Uh, Well, well, I can't get with you or I would, but I know (laughs) you've got an IT geek in your life somewhere. So they can help you out. Actually, you could get with her just for that. Uh, why couldn't he? No bother. So I'm just trying to make sure that I understand that I can't post about anything unless I want to record, the record it and send it to someone. I shouldn't uh, say anything else on Facebook about the lagoon, right? <laughs> well, it's about business that's going to come before this. Committee. Which is about anything. That's my problem. But she can post. If the question yeah. is, the, you can post, the, you need to figure out how to retain it. To the posts. Okay. Right. You figure out how to retain it, and no other member should reply to it. And the stream? Like it. And the comment stream? If you don't, is part of public record? No, if you, don't recon- if you don't respond to your own comment, you only need your comment. That's your voice going out. All right. But if you do add a comment, that too. Okay. We'll work through that. It's good it stuff. sounds Thank like. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis? Just again, in utmost of caution, um, uh, talking about voting conflicts of interest, I am the president of the Space Coast Association of Realtors right now. It's a volunteer position. We've got 4,200 members plus. Uh, I'm sure things we discuss here will probably inure to some of those members, I'm guessing. I probably won't know that it's <laughs> making them better, um, but uh, uh, just as a straight general comment, for the rest of this year I'll be the president. That's fine. It has to be a special financial gain, so that it has to have a direct impact yeah. versus... Just wanted to direct. throw that out because I didn't say it in my, in my bio. Thank you. Christine, did that conclude your yes. presentation? All right, so um, it is 10 to 10. Dylan, how much time? Dylan? Brandon. No, yeah. Brandon's, Brandon's going to be Dylan today. <laughs> Hi, Dylan. Well, was it going to be more than 10 minutes? I was going to have a break at 10 o'clock. Uh, depending how many videos we show. So we have the one uh, baffle box, and then we have four of the My Lagoon stories. So those are two minutes each, and then how long is the baffle box? Uh, it's those, short. Yeah, it's okay, yeah. So we'll proceed. Yeah, we'll watch them. Yeah. Then we'll right. take a break after. is a box with a series of settling chambers. There's three settling chambers within the box. Um, it's placed in line with the stormwater pipe. As the stormwater passes through, the sediment, debris, and trash gets settled into the bottom of these chambers. And then we'll come back with a vacuum truck and, and remove all of that trash and debris so that it doesn't enter the lagoon. The debris can uh, consist of leaves, grass clippings, and other things that can get into the lagoon and decompose and release nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus are one of the main contributors to the loss of seagrass, and seagrass is important to the habitat and wildlife of the Indian River Lagoon. We have five baffle boxes going in this year with the city of Titusville, um, which are partially funded through the Save Our Indian River Lagoon program. We have three within the South Street Basin, another in St. Teresa Basin, and another in the La Paloma Basin. They will all be installed within this fiscal year. Our timeline was increased by being able to get funding through the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Plan. (laughs) (laughs) This is the South Street Basin Baffle Box Project for this. These are on the website already. Hi, I'm Charlie Venuto, and I am the science alternate chair for the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Citizens Oversight Committee. I came to Melbourne 
to attend graduate school at the Florida Institute of Technology, where I studied under Dr. John Treffrey. As part of my research, I was studying heavy metals in the Indian River Lagoon mullet. To collect my samples, I went out with a commercial fisherman, and we would leave the docks in the evening before sunset, and we'd stay out on the lagoon the entire night, coming back in the morning. There was often a very impressive set of fish that were harvested during the night, and including some of the large so-called gator trout. Back in this time period, around 1979 and 80, the Indian River Lagoon was known as the sea trout capital of the world. But you know, that's a phrase you don't hear uttered anymore. The lagoon is a geographical feature that unites our county and our region. If there's one thing that we can all rally around, it's to stop the decline of the lagoon and to restore it to its natural beauty and prominence. There are many things we can all do to help the lagoon, and a couple of things that I participate in are include litter cleanups, oyster restoration habitat, as well as picking up after my dog. There's a great plan to restore the lagoon, and it's based on scientific principles. I think the most important things we have in our plan are to remove the muck, because the muck is contributing to a nitrogen and phosphorus loading and also covers the bottom sediments. And we also need to stop the input from nearby septic systems and from stormwater runoff. It's gonna take time. It took a long time to get us into this decline and it's gonna take us a while to get back. But with patience and perseverance, we can restore the lagoon back to what it was like in the 1970s and 80s. And if we do it right, maybe we could even restore ourselves to the sea trout capital of the world. Good morning, I'm John Windsor. I'm on the Citizens Oversight Committee for the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Project Plan. I uh, have been on this committee for almost two years now. The uh, spot we're standing at is the mouth of Crane Creek. Crane Creek has been a interesting place for me for the last three decades plus. I've been taking students out and teaching them how to do water quality measurements from this location. Uh, I've seen the lagoon change over time and I've been very concerned about changes over time, not just over the last 10 or 20 years, but over the last 100 years and over the last 1,000 years. Uh, I think it's really important for us to keep focusing on change and what effects change have on the environment and uh, I hope that we uh, can do a good job on the Citizens Oversight Committee to make sure that the money is being spent effectively uh, for restoring our lagoon. One of the reasons I decided to jump into this fray of uh, trying to restore the lagoon, uh, it's actually not a jump for me. I've been working on it for 35 years now and have been fighting an uphill battle all the way. Uh, it's important that somebody on the Citizens Oversight Committee has an important scientific perspective on the lagoon an important advocacy position on the Indian River Lagoon. And uh, I've been working on the lagoon. I've served on the governor's task force on the Indian River Lagoon. I've served on a number of committees. Uh, I was for 30 years, I was the technical advisory committee uh, chairman for the National Estuary Program. Uh, so I thought that perhaps more than anybody else, I could offer some insight into what we've done in the past and what we need to do in the future. The biggest challenges I see to the lagoon are probably in the area of growth management. And so from a big picture perspective, the more people we bring in, no matter how effective we are at containing their wastes, they're going to cause degradation to the lagoon. So it's really important for us to look at the impacts of new growth while trying to fix the problems of old growth. Things that we've done in the past that we don't do anymore, uh, but we need to be more efficient about any development that we have and prevent further damage to the Indian River Lagoon. My name is Danielle Bowden. I'm a realtor and I serve on the Citizen Oversight Committee for the Indian River Lagoon. I'm here today outside of Wild Ocean Seafood Market. This is a place where I grew up with a father that's a commercial fisherman. The lagoon is also where I spent a lot of time as a child and I feel that it's important that my children can experience the same future. I want them to enjoy the same childhood that I grew up in. 
um, out in the lagoon, in the waterways, and having fun. As a realtor, I understand how important the lagoon is for real estate values today and in the future. And that's why I chose to serve on the Citizen Oversight Committee. Hi, uh, my name is David Lane. I'm the voting uh, tourism member of the Save Our Lagoon Citizen Oversight Committee. I wanted to speak with you today about uh, the privilege that I have about serving on the committee and my background and, and love of the lagoon. Uh, I'm one of the fortunate few here in Brevard County that grew up on the lagoon, uh, having been on Merritt Island since 1973, uh, surrounded by you know, lagoon waters on all sides. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I have very early memories of, of uh, recreating on the lagoon, uh, going back uh, really as early as about uh, age six or eight. And ever since then, um, a lot of my life has been dedicated around the, the science uh, of the lagoon, lagoon ecology. Over the last 20 years, I have seen deterioration of the lagoon uh, really starting from a, a loss of our mollusk populations. Um, I remember as an early teenager, uh, clamming got shut down, and that might have really been the first a harbinger of things to come for the lagoon uh, back in the uh, mid to late 80s. Um, since that time, we had seen degradation of oyster populations and then, of course, uh, seagrass die-offs. Um, in 2016, we had the, the, the big uh, brown uh, algae bloom and uh, the subsequent fish die-off, and that's what made national headlines. That's what really affected our business. I actually was receiving calls from other uh, nations, other continents even, about the health of our lagoon, people were actually calling me, they were calling our shop to uh, find out if it was worth coming to Brevard County uh, because they knew they wanted to go on a manatee tour or they knew they wanted uh, to uh, see some dolphins or, um, or they wanted to do some fishing on the lagoon. Restoring the lagoon to its historical health and beauty I think is imperative uh, from an economic standpoint. The residents of Brevard County and around the state, and really around the nation, know about the plight of our lagoon. But what's not happening, it's a struggle that we need to work on, and it's something I work on every day, is, is discussing what local residents can do, people that actually live in the Indian River Lagoon watershed. Uh, nutrient influx into the lagoon being such a big issue that it is, as a homeowner on the watershed of the lagoon, you have, um, you have options at your disposal, and that includes um, zero escaping your lawn, getting rid of the sod or limiting the sod that you have in your yard. Uh, the other issue uh, we're facing is uh, septic tanks. Uh, we have about a half a million septic tanks in Brevard County um, and a lot of those, are, the vast majority of those are traditional septic systems. If you're on a septic system um, and you want to help, um, there are alternatives to improving the performance of your system to limiting those nutrients and if you're in the lagoon watershed, there are certainly many alternatives towards uh, landscaping your yard in such a manner to minimize fertilizers, uh, which would then uh, limit nutrient inflows into the river uh, whenever we have a rain event. When the um, announcements were made that uh, Brevard County was gonna put on the ballot a half cent sales tax towards uh, lagoon restoration efforts, I knew I really wanted to get involved. And I'm extremely privileged to be on the committee uh, working towards uh, solving uh, some of the problems that the lagoon faces today. So the Bath Logs video will be uploading to social media probably this afternoon. Uh, we had some issues this last week uploading videos to Facebook. Yes. Everybody, so, has. So, Everybody yeah. did. So hopefully those are resolved and we can get at least, if it can't get on Facebook this week, it'll be on YouTube at least. And then we've been releasing the um, My Lagoon Story videos every two weeks. We've been putting a new one of those out. So how are those boxes performing? Are they performing well? Are they pregnant? Just... Uh we haven't, the, the, those baffle boxes are obviously just being installed now, yes, so we can't yes. monitor them yet, mm -hmm. but um, we, they, their performance really varies depending on the cleaning cycle, okay. and uh, when the county increased the stormwater fee back in 2014, we went to much more frequent cleaning. Um, I think the cities, many of the cities have done the same.
and so you know they. they yeah, they're huge. <coughs> I, yeah, they, I can see the maintenance on. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes a lot to, mm -hmm. to keep them working, mm -hmm. but they're an important tool in the oh, toolbox. Yeah. yeah. Was that it for the are, for the videos? Oh, yes. Are the new members being scheduled for their videos? They will be. <laughs> the hazing continues, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Tortured equally. <laughs> right, so we're going to take a very punctual five-minute break. Wow. See you guys in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Before we continue, I want to take one moment, and um, something was brought to my attention um, during the break that that I might be too optimistic in my my views of the successes we're having in the lagoon and where we're at, and that I might be projecting uh, false hope. False hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my response to that is that I'm going to celebrate our successes no matter how small they are. And I find them to be monumentally important. And I understand that our successes are, are local to the projects that we're working on. We have projects current and proposed from one end of the lagoon to the other. And hundreds of small projects are going to add up over time. And we're going to see this lagoon restored the way we want it restored. So I'm not going to apologize for being optimistic. And anybody that thinks I'm projecting false hope, I would just ask you to fight with me. Keep fighting. And I think in the end, we'll all see and appreciate and love the response uh, that, that the lagoon gets from all of our, all of our projects and really the, the, you know, the love and the concern and the effort we all put into it. So I'm going to continue to celebrate our successes, no matter how small they are. I think it's vitally important. Since I threw out the uh, false hope thing, can I just respond? Well, we all have a sort of a barometer and a needle and a way we approach things. And, 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 and I applaud you and I encourage you and I think we need to be positive about the value that this program is bringing to the lagoon. Where I'm at, and I tend to, I'm ambivalent by nature, right? Not, and, and the other side of it is, it's not a slam dunk. There are a lot of things that are that are that are factors that are working against us. I think the worst thing that could happen is that we get people spun up to say, "Big tax thing. Everything is now beautiful." And you know, the next fish kill we have, you know, people go, you know, nuts because you know we're spending all this money, we're not getting results. So I would just try to 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 temper the, the optimism with um, a dash of, uh, I would call it reality or realism, or a recognition that the, there are lots of problems. And as I said earlier, not, it's not just the lagoon, right? It's all across the state. In fact, it's all across the country. So uh, that's it. Thank you, Terry. Uh, one other thing. Uh, my video uh, was supposed to be re Tape. Um, Dylan called me and said we were going to retape it, and I said, "Okay, let's reschedule it." And then next thing I see, we're watching. It. So uh, we can blame him. Um, all right. So moving forward, we have the 2019 plan update. Okay. So um, the 1st thing was just making sure you're aware of the county commission workshop um, on April 18th at one o'clock in this room. So we've talked about that a lot now. So um, moving on to the 2019 plan update, you have um, in your packet the, the clerk's memo that's the record of the board action on the plan that you recommended. So on February 26th, the board approved all non-muck removal and non-interstitial water treatment items contained within the 2019 Save Our New River Lagoon project plan with the exception of the stormwater pond maintenance and excess irrigation um, the advertising funds uh, as proposed by the committee um, and approved an initial maximum of $125 million toward muck removal and or interstitial water treatment. Um, and so what I need to know uh, is which of the muck projects in the plan um, you want to fund with that $125 million that has been authorized. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of take you on a behind-the-scenes tour of how we put projects together in the plan um, in case that is helpful for uh, anybody. 
um, and, and then try to get your recommendation on, on how we proceed um, and uh, have some options. So I'm going to move over here. Um, so we know that nutrient loading into the lagoon comes from uh, numerous sources, and the intent of the plan was to try to dig into each of those sources and understand the scale of each of the contributions from those different sources and uh, what sorts of projects could be done to limit that loading from those sources and what were those costs, and, and then you know, look for the low-hanging fruit. And so historically, um, the, this is, you know, going back uh, 20, 30 years in the lagoon, the majority of pollution coming into the lagoon was from point sources. It was discharges from uh, wastewater treatment plants, hundreds of package treatment plants all around the lagoon, and with the passage of the Clean Water Act, followed by the Indian River Lagoon Act, um, uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to take those uh, package plants, take that wastewater, and take it to larger centralized systems, uh, treat that water, and then use it for reclaimed. Um, also, local governments, you know, across the state uh, developed stormwater utilities, stormwater programs, um, and we have implemented over 500 uh, stormwater projects in the unincorporated county, uh, in addition to all of the city projects that were out there. And so when we look at, you know, what is the situation more like today, um, that point source pollution has dramatically decreased, um, but septic systems have increased with the, the growth in population. Um, atmospheric deposition has decreased with implementation of some of the clean air standards. Um, stormwater runoff has decreased because of all those projects that have been done over the last few decades. Muck has increased. And so when we look at this distribution of where the sources are or the conveyance channels for um, nitrogen loading and phosphorus loading now, uh, this helps set the stage for how projects were selected in the plan. So a review of the responsibility of the committee. This is come straight from the ordinance. Under the Citizen Oversight Committee, there's a whole section on responsibilities, numbered one through five. So I paraphrased one through five with fewer words. Hopefully, uh, I haven't done injustice here. But you know, the first thing is, is to adapt to better information and opportunities through time. Um, number two is review alternative projects submitted by municipalities. And the, it lists a whole lot of other kinds of partners. Um, review monitoring data, literature, and local studies, and then use all of that information to recommend annual adjustments to the plan. And then number five, I, I did this one verbatim, projects that deliver comparable nutrient removal benefits may be added or substituted in the same sublagoon, unless otherwise agreed to by the county commission, if a substituted project costs more than the project listed in the plan, the requesting partner must provide the balance of costs. Looks like I accidentally put a period instead of a comma in, in, the, in there, but the word should be accurate. So, so that's your role, um, and, and we as staff try to facilitate, try to bring you the data and the literature and the studies and the speakers and collect those substitute projects uh, from the rest of the community uh, for you to review. So. Um, Right now, as I said, you know, at a minimum, we need to know uh, which muck projects should proceed uh, with the 125 million that has been approved by the county commission. And so I think this morning you sort of have three options. Um, one is after you figure out what you want to do with that 125 million, uh, with the 100 of million that is unallocated, you know, do, do you leave that unallocated, or which is option one? Option two, uh, do you develop one or more alternatives for how to allocate that entire $100 million? Or option three, do you come up with one or more options to allocate a portion of that $100 million and make that a recommendation to the county commission? And the, the remainder could come back in the 2020 plan or in you know, some further out year uh, during the, the life of the, the tax. Is that? Reading your 
in your next steps. You start with 125, everything else is 100. Does that mean 25 is? 25 is. So what was in the plan that you recommended was $225 million worth of mock projects. And the county commission said, proceed with 125 million of mock projects, come back to us with alternative ideas on the other 100 million. On the other 100. On the other 100. 100. Spend 125 on muck, come back with alternate proposals for the remaining 100 million. And is the 125 that's to be allocated, are those already been prioritized based upon project status? Um, that's what we need to do yeah. here. So there was, um, there was language in the commissioner's agenda item that did not get captured in the clerk's memo about moving forward with projects that have grants. So it's, re it's really two steps. One is to allocate the 125, and then two is decide what our feedback is on the remaining 100. Correct. I want to, talk to that, I, I know that there's a lot of different options, and I, that, I think we could do the 125 and then figure out what we want to do with the 100. The way that I'm kind of thinking, or one of the things, because I'll tell you the truth, I've, I've been struggling over this, and I'm sure many people have, is if we discuss what we're going to do with the 100 or what we want to do, that may affect if we throw some money back into MUC, um, and then uh, staff may be able to figure out which projects would best. Um, so I don't know if we want to treat it as a separate item or if we want to treat it as a whole item. The other question I had is, Christine, do we need to take public comment before we just start this discussion on this agenda item? You can have your discussion first, then take public comment, and then formulate your, your ideas for a motion. Okay. So I'm, what I'm confused by is this, the, the 225 that's in discussion is the 10-year plan. Correct. Right? And, and we have direction that says 125 and 100 and go figure it out. But to me, what we're, the, the real concern, what are we going to spend in the next year, right? Which is, what, what number is that? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so I, I can try to get you there, okay. but you know that these mock projects take a lot of time to right. get permitted and designed and ready to go. And so we're actually working on many years' worth of mock projects currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if, if we let Virginia move forward with trying to describe what to do with some of this money and how what's committed now and what may need to be shifted around. It might make this discussion a little bit easier. Uh, but I think we need to deal with the 125 first and then and then deal with the 100 million after that. Yep. Well, so, so let me let me just say because I have spent a lot of time thinking about this and what what my feeling on this and I've I've talked um, to commissioners, I've talked to Virginia um, is the sheet that you have in front of you, the muck dredging with the interstitial water treatment, that's the smaller sheet. What, what I'm thinking, because these projects do take years to start the permit process and start the grant process, is you'll see those two orange ones at the end. Those two orange ones already have started work. And I think Virginia said there's 37,000 combined between them. So it's not a large amount, but there is money and effort already put into those. So what I, what I was thinking is, is that we look at maybe approving <clears throat> everything to the left of that with part of the 100, and that would put us at anything less than around 1,200 pounds per nitrogen a year would be removed. And then, I, you want to? If, if you could, why don't you let Virginia introduce yeah. these, because there are people oh, here I'm who sorry. don't have any idea. This okay. just landed on their desk right. like five minutes ago. <laughs> and so it, I think you're a little bit ahead. But I am, I, and I, I apologize. Going, I'm excited, Dr. Wendy. That's why, I, that's why I suggest let Virginia go Let's forward with explaining what the graphs are. Uh, interpretation can come later and what to do with it later, but I think everybody needs to know what we're looking at first. I agree. Thank you, John. Thank you. So I, I just did some cut and paste out of the plan. So, right, this is table 4-9 from the plan. Um, we evaluated all the wastewater treatment plants in the county, both incorporated and unincorporated, and we looked at what is the current uh, concentration of water in, concentration of nutrients in the reclaimed water, what would it cost to clean up that reclaimed water to a lower concentration before it gets distributed in irrigation lines, 
And then how cost effective is that? And so um, the, the, let me see, this column here, cost per pound uh, per year of total nitrogen removed, right? The, this table is in order from the least cost per pound to the most cost per pound. Um, and the other ones are on the next page and they cost even more. So the four that are in green are the ones that were most cost effective and are listed as funded in the plan. And you see that the next one, if you wanted to do one more, it would cost almost double, right? Significantly more. So as we, I'm gonna walk you through a few of these tables. When we developed the plan, we sort of started out with $1,000 as our threshold for, okay, let's see what happens if we fund everything that's up to $1,000 per pound in each project type, and then we'll add all that up and we'll see whether we're close, whether we're way over budget, way under budget, have we reduced enough nutrients for a healthy lagoon, we're far off, you know, where are we? And we came up in that original plan, uh, everything was sort of balanced somewhere between $1,000 and $1,200 a pound is our cutoff. When the revenues came in um, higher than anticipated in the first year and we saw that construction costs were also ramping up very quickly. You know, we redid all of the economics in the plan and that cutoff point is more like $1,200 to $1,500 per pound. So if you keep that range in your head, you'll see as we go table by table um, how, this, how this happens, right? So uh, in the plan added this year, and I'm sorry, you cannot read, at least I cannot read those, um, but same deal. You know, we looked at all the different options for how to upgrade these project areas, what was the cost per pound, and we funded the most cost effective ones. We left the other ones there so you could see that the analysis exists um, and how much it would cost to add yet, you know, one more project of this type. This one, thank goodness, is a little bit more legible, right? So connecting package plants to central sewer. We tried to do uh, this math, but because we um, uh, didn't have great cost information, um, these costs are very high. So the, the le what appeared to be the least cost one is over $1,500 per pound. We have a bunch here that either the, where you would want to connect that package plant to does not have capacity currently to take that plant, or we didn't have enough data from the package plant to know what the concentrations are now. We're working with the county's utilities staff to collect samples, um, to get access to these private facilities, to collect information um, and, and provide uh, better opportunities here. So septic to sewer, and on the other ones I just showed you, you know, county wide, but we really did this sublagoon by sublagoon, right? Because we, if all the most cost effective projects were uh, in southern Brevard, that wasn't going to do much for Titusville or the Banana River, right? So you really have to look region by region. So here are septic to sewer opportunities. Um, the top table is in the Banana River. The bottom table is the Central Lagoon, which is from 192 south. Um, and so you see that we funded uh, everything to right here. We did not fund the one that was $1,477. That was our cutoff in the, in the current plan. In the Central Lagoon, we funded the one that's for 1,046, but not the next one that was double that at um, 2,200. And then in the Banana River, um, you see the, the lineup. So we funded up to $1,200. We did not fund these ones that were more expensive. And so the reason that it's kind of a range, sometimes it's 1500 as the cutoff, sometimes it's $1,200 as a cutoff, is because we're trying to provide a certain amount of nutrient reduction in each watershed, and depending on the cost of the projects and what opportunities are available in each project type in each sublagoon, those costs, those cutoffs vary a little bit. So we did the same thing with muck removal. And this um, got updated tremendously in this 2019 update because of the 
additional data collection that had been done by the researchers at Florida Tech. Um, so here's the, the cost per pound reduction, and you'll see we went you know, right up. So we did have one that was just over 1,500, 1,511 pounds. Um, this was, what we, what we did was we, we kept it under $1,500 per pound with the exception that we included an allowance um, for canals and channels in each sub-lagoon. We put a pot of money in for treating 30% of the muck in channels. Um, we have not had an opportunity yet to probe every single canal and figure out which canals are worst we have an idea that there's muck in most of them. Um, and so we wanted to be able to address that problem. We can't do all of it, so we, we include an allowance to address about 30% of, of the canals in each sub-lagoon. And so we also talked um, in this group, and Dr. Windsor's brought it up previously, that you know, the, the currency of the plan is nitrogen removal and the cost effectiveness of nitrogen removal. We know phosphorus is very important in the lagoon. We know total suspended solids is important in the lagoon. Um, oxygen supply, dissolved oxygen is important. And so, you know, just to, to be uh, transparent about the benefits of, of muck dredging versus um, and the benefits of, of sewage infrastructure. and, and when I put sewage infrastructure here, this was an inclusive sewage infrastructure. So this is all the different kinds of sewage infrastructure projects that we have in the plan, whether it's wastewater treatment upgrades, septic to sewer projects, septic upgrade projects, um, uh, package plant connections. But it's those in the plan. Yes. Correct. Yes. Um, and so, you know, either way, you're reducing nutrients, whether you're spending dollars on muck or you're spending dollars on, on sewage infrastructure, you're reducing benefits, you're reducing oxygen consumption, increasing dissolved oxygen in the lagoon, you're reducing the likelihood of algal blooms and fish kills. On the muck side, you're also improving water clarity and visibility, um, and you're reducing the amount of bottom, the area of bottom that is where seagrass uh, would be smothered and where you know, filter feeders can't survive. On the infrastructure side, you're reducing the risk of pathogens, you know, less antibiotics and immunosuppressants and endocrine disruptors, all sorts of things that we know are out there from uh, various uh, research that's been done in the lagoon on marine, on marine mammals, finding, finding these things. So there are definitely you know, benefits besides nitrogen that are important on you know, whichever way you put the dollars. So Vinny's, this is the table um, Vinny was uh, talking to. So we took all of the muck projects that were in the plan. So if you added up all of these that are funded in the plan, they would add up to 225 million. The board has approved 125 million and the agenda item spoke to funding the ones that are leveraging grants. So the green, the dark green bars are the projects that either have already secured grants or have pending legislative appropriations or other grant applications out there. The orange ones are already in permitting. So we have invested dollars because they were approved projects in the 2018 plan we have moved forward with permitting those projects and we've already spent dollars. And so um, you can see, uh, and maybe I shouldn't have done this. So when, when you do that, um, then there's um, some funds. If you funded uh, all of the dark green and all of the orange, then these four bars here in light green and lavender would not be funded. The lavender bars would not be funded. The orange and green collectively um, 
added up to just under $100 million. I've got the math somewhere, 90 something million dollars. And so I took what was left of that 125 and said, well, if, if we follow the process of allocating that to the most cost effective muck projects, right, that would be these, these four right here. And so you could fully fund these first three, but you could only partially fund the, the fourth one. Does that, did I explain that? Is that clear as mud? So, <laughs> so sorry. sorry. So to, to, to fully fund all four of those projects um, that uh, I think of them as the gap, right, a funding gap, um, would require an additional $36.6 million. The reason that those projects weren't already started, weren't already, you know, permitted or underway is these were new projects that were identified by Dr. Treffrey's team and their research um, over the last year or two. And so they weren't in the plan until the t proposed 2019 update. If you want to continue um, in filling in the gaps and catch those next four projects, um, they are smaller projects with smaller budgets, um, and so we would need another $15.4 million to fund that shortfall. Now, alternatively, you could stop work on the two orange bars at the right side of the graph. This is what um, I believe Vinny was talking about. Right, we could we have spent um, about thirty-seven thousand dollars on permitting, gathering data for uh, permit preparation for those two projects. You could take those dollars and allocate them to help fill the gap over at the um, to reduce this short wall. <laughs> right, these these two collectively uh, would free up. I think it was about $14 million to reduce this, this shortfall. So can I ask a question real quick? So the ones in the lavender, no work has been done on any of those projects? Correct. No engineering, no surveying, nothing? Just research has been done through the legislative appropriations okay. to identify, you know, that muck is there and how much it's fluxing and how area is uh -huh. so that we could come up with a rough approximation of cost Understood. but no okay. no but half cent sales tax yeah. has been spent on those projects okay in the lavender in the lavender gotcha but the light green has that, had that's no. the new and so new data these latest and greatest four data. right yeah. i should i guess i should have left them as lavender these four projects here are also lavender but we've approved them though not yet Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. They were in the 20, they were okay. added in, in the, the 2019 plan recommended by the Oversight Committee, but since the funding is not the same as what you recommended, we have to amend <coughs> this portion of the plan. Let me ask you the one other quick question. If you go to those there um, with the green, the light green, is there a dewatering site available for those? projects that we know of now, or is that something we'd have to acquire? Um, port Canaveral, it would depend on the timing. Mm -hmm. We've met with the port, and they have a site that if we moved quickly, uh, we could use. Um, if okay. It depends on the timing. Um, Pineda over the Banana River, I think that one is a, a challenge. Yeah. I'm looking at Walker. Um, Goat Creek. That project, um, FIND is developing a new site down there. Uh, that project really um, should be done in tandem with this Mullet Creek project here. So okay. if we don't do the Mullet Creek project, then it's probably not really feasible to do Goat Creek as a standalone. Okay. Um, and then this, you know, Cocoa Beach Golf Course is a is an enormous project mm -hmm. um, that I don't know whether we could use the the NASA site or What's, you know. Yeah, do you know its viability? 
or estimate? In, in what regards? Just any of the where where to take the muck, right? Where to dewater the muck? Um, we haven't invested a, a bunch of time into investigating DMMA sites yet. Um, I know we've had some high level discussions with city staff. Um, I know they've been pretty creative in, in their locations and could potentially work something out with them. But that's a significant quantity of material. I'm not sure right. their site's right. best. Right. Okay, and then just going back to the lavender ones, how about like the where it says the 15.4 mil <coughs> million? How about those? Are those areas that have easily acceptable, I mean, not easily, but you know, I mean, is there, is that going to be a challenge to, it seems like the dewatering sites are a challenge and kind of holds up, you know, holds us up sometimes. If, if we Walker, keep as I a, don't know the answer. You know. So, I, 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 without going uh, pro project by project, you know, I, we do have some sites that, that we have likely have, you know, fine sites available mm -hmm. to use. Um, but we haven't done a full dewatering site and detailed analysis as of yet. Okay. So the, the projects in the Banana River are quite challenging because the fine sites are all on along the intercoastal water. They're for the most part on the mainland. Mm -hmm. There's one on, you know, Merritt Island, um, with another one in design. But they're the Banana River is very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> is there any room left at the sites that Cocoa Beach will use for their for their canal dredging? Well, those are it's they're temporary sites and and Wayne's here, but um, so they've you know bermed off very small areas and they are um, uh, typically you know pumping the slurry into there, partially dewatering it, and yeah. then trucking that material uh, somewhere else to complete the dewatering cycle. Oh wow! So. That's a process. You know, it's just the beach side. It's hard to get mm -hmm. the sites. Mm -hmm. Well, I was actually on the committee that the Cocoa Beach had some additional sites, but the our land management committee made the decision not to deposit muck in the lagoon that could rep on upland sites that could represent an ongoing source sure. back into the lagoon in the future. So I think Cocoa Beach and I know our committee is very proud of that decision because mm -hmm. that effort was made to to truly get that those nutrients mm -hmm. outside of the basin. Yeah. So, so from my perspective, I'm wondering if we're taking money away from Cocoa Beach and the Banana River there, a significant amount of funds, what do we have to replace that to clean up that area? Thanks for that segue. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, uh, for the most part, these are septic to sewer projects. So what I did was I took, you know, uh, well, not all of the projects in the plan, but the, the first however 30 or however many that is, um, that were evaluated as a part of the plan. So everything that is not on this graph is more expensive than what's on this graph. The green ones are the ones that are funded, currently funded in the plan, as adopted by the, as approved by the board. The uh, reddish colored ones are ones that there is no capacity at the closest wastewater treatment plant to take those neighborhoods, even though it's cost effective to build the collection system and get it to the wastewater treatment plant. We can't just overwhelm the plant and, and legally you're not allowed to do that. So, um, so if you ignore the orange ones for now, um, we can certainly hope that there are ways to increase the capacity at the plants, and we might be able to come back to these later in the life of the tax, but for now, they're, they're not an option. So the lavender ones are the ones that we have uh, identified since the board action, uh, working with utilities, um, looking for additional project opportunities. And so if you wanted to fund all of them in the blue bracket, um, extends out to $1,500 per pound. Projects that cost uh, up to less than and up to $1,500 per pound of nitrogen removed. Um, it would take $32 million to fund all of the lavender projects in that bracket. Um, quick question. Go ahead, Courtney. Um, has any, well, what's first, what is the utility for Grant Valteria? 
it seems like all of the lacking capacity is Grant Falcon. Right, it would be Barefoot Bay, which Barefoot has Bay. No okay, I understood. Yeah, that's it. Um, so has any work been done at all? Engineering, concept planning, anything for any of those projects that we're gonna add to this? Not that I'm aware of. So it's not gonna start anytime soon. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, if it were fully funded, mm -hmm. It would be a matter of, you know, staff right. to, to get this started. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would happen though if we moved questions. in that direction. Right? Correct. That would, yeah. Correct. So so your question, I haven't quite answered your question. And I have another one. Okay. <laughs> right. So yes, a lot of the uh, lavender bars in the muck chart were in the banana river. And while some of these lavender bars are in, would address water in the Banana River, there's a disproportionate um, share that are actually in the northern IRL, so in the Indian River between 192 and the north end of the county. And so, you know, if we did just this simple shift of take the 100 million uh, from Mock and, and fund these projects, we're going to have a disproportionate situation where we're spending more and doing more nutrient reduction in the northern Indian River and less nutrient reduction in the Banana River. So we have less balance in the river for cleanup and we're spending more money on pounds of nitrogen, total nitrogen, by switching this. Yes, this is the moment when I should disclose that all of these costs are estimates, right? Both the cost of the project is an estimate and the nutrient removal benefit is an estimate. And so, you know, there's wiggle room, obviously. There's error on every single one of these estimates. And so, you know, if you want to create a, a $1,200 cutoff for muck and a $1,500 cutoff for sewer, that's probably still in the realm of mm -hmm. equity mm -hmm. in terms of you know, bang, bang for your buck. Um, so, I, I don't think we have to be exact about that number because these these cost effectiveness calculations aren't exact. But mm -hmm. yes, but, but we're still a fair distance off. Yes. Okay. Paul, I do have a question. It might be a simple question. Um, why is there such a big spread between the costs? Um, so cost on per pound. yes, on on muck, the. The major factor is that sometimes the muck is a few feet thick and sometimes the muck is 20 feet thick and the benefit that we're reporting for muck is not how much, how many cubic Nothing yards long. are being removed, but by the presence of that muck being there and breaking down, it is releasing nutrients to the water column above. So it's the surface area that equates to the Got the it. impact, and so, so you take shallow muck is cheaper yeah. to you remove. You take the off the deep top muck. layer, and then the next layer starts to keep Correct. just producing. fluxes. Okay. Correct. I just a couple things. One, first, I want to thank you for the data presentation because both this graph as well as your introductory chart of what the historic contributions as well as current contributions that those first two graphs I think are the best that I've seen <laughs> in talking about that this is a decade-long shift in the contributions of material. So thank you for that. And I think that those two slides those are... Those kudos go to Brandon. Nice job. They're Brandon. awesome. And I think we should continue to highlight those because those start to tell the story that this isn't a snapshot in time. Um, I, I know from my perspective, too, I think what you've laid out is a, a great initial cut at it. The other thing is we've been back and forth with the commission. I don't know that there's a reason to not continue to go back and forth a little bit as well. I, I think where you're starting is perfect. One of the things that, that I look at is you know, if you look, if you have this 32 million that has been moved over to, that, that could be help fund septic. Yeah, that's, I don't know that I see that as a bad thing, but then that's all, that's 30 million of the 100. Um, you know, if, if you can continue to even expand that slightly further, I, I did some rough calculations. I think you should could get over to about the South Beaches Septics Project and, and still fund the rest of your purple lines 
on the muck with that 100 million, basically pushing back to the county and say, okay, we understand you wanted to cut out a muck, but cut 50 million instead of 100 million. Mm -hmm. And that would allow some shift over into septic, which I will say I do support right now. We've got public support. We're in the same ballpark. Septic is, I don't think anybody's going to, at, at some future point when we have to, we're going to have to continue funding past 10 years. Right now there's appetite for septic. I can tell you as, a, as running a utility, there have been decades worth of people not willing to switch off to septics onto central sewer systems. If the appetite is there right now, let's capture it because that represents some, mm -hmm. uh, some opportunity to eliminate this, a source that's going to continue on for decades. And so I, I, I know from my perspective, I would <laughs> propose pushing back slightly to say, okay, we understand that you wanted to cut money from Mock. You proposed to cut $100 million. We propose, we're coming back to you and saying, we propose instead you cut 50. That would allow us to fund the majority of these purple projects that you have underneath your two brackets. You could then still take that remaining 50. You've got the 32 million here in the, um, underneath your bracket on the septic, and you could extend that even further to the right to get up to that 50 million spend. And I think that shows the spirit of compromise. The other thing that I like about it is we're not being asked at this point to divert funds into centralized utility infrastructure upgrades that we have not supported, but we're just supporting some shifts within the plan that are already projects that have made sense, that, that have contributed ongoing nitrogen contributions to the, to the lagoon, and that are fitting with um, appetite amongst the community uh, to move projects mm -hmm. forward. So yeah. just a concept a from looking at these numbers uh, that, that I think would be a good way to come back to the mm -hmm. Corbin? Is, is there any, because I have a concern about the, the, the basin equality as well, like is there any septic projects that are down the line that would affect the, the Banana River area that we could add? It, it just to speed up a little bit. I know they're not as cost effective, but would that would that help in the distribution a little bit? I think here? that's one of the things I was thinking too. Okay. That if you went back yeah. with this proposal, because that Cocoa Beach is okay. project is in the Banana River, right? You would have it wouldn't be septic. But candidly, part of the reason for that Cocoa Beach has done an outstanding job and has no septics. Right. You well, know, that, there's was, nothing to that, that brings up my second mm -hmm. point is there's, I know of cities that are working on dredging projects right now that haven't applied for funding yet. So um, is there a way that we could go back and ask those cities where they're at to see what those upcoming projects are? Because I'd hate to see us, you know, just dash that and, and all of their work up until this point. Well, I think we change every year. We do an update. So if they did get us a project at the end of this year, we could... If those project cities came to us and they were cheaper, we could substitute them out. Well, I understand that, but you're, but we're, this is like a 10 year, you know, funding shift. So, well, I guess that's true. You know, so yeah, you're right. That, that's true. Yes. Am I correct? In well, you could that? recommend substitutions, um, but, you know, where, where would that money come from? So correct. Would it, yeah. would it mean cutting? muck projects that we had then started on permitting That's for, correct. or would it mean cutting septic to sewer projects that right. just got added that we might start right. permitting Right, and that's my concern. Is and so if you, if you think that there are projects coming from whatever partners, it would probably be better to, it might be better to leave some dollars unallocated. Correct. Just to make sure okay. that and, we can... And we could yeah. do a big push for folks you know, saying this next round for the 2020 plan is going to be really important um, in terms of, you know, getting your right. project ideas. And, and even if you're not ready, you know, yes. if you could give us an idea of what's coming in the future. And then, and then I, because I like this, I, you know, what you were saying, and, and maybe we just, instead of, you know, can we just leave the rest, just say we're going to leave, we'd recommend leaving this unallocated since we're just kind of waiting on projects? Is that something we can do instead of saying it's going to go to one certain pot? The other question I have is, you know, would it be advantageous? Well, I mean, we, when we do the call for projects, 
Um, I think the Cocoa Beach, um, the, the utility project was a good example of what we could do for the utilities. And, and that may be something we can send out to the utilities and say, hey, you got anything this year, you know, or next year? Because that seems to be, you know, but we want to make sure that we stay in that nutrient reduction, you know, realm, above and beyond realm, you know. Um, and so I think Cocoa Beach had a good project that, you know, I mean, they were the first that came in, so they got, you know, grilled for an hour. But, um, but I think that's a good, a good baseline that we can use to give give the example. You know, when we meet with them for when we um, when we do the meeting with all the partners, we can kind of highlight that project and say, hey, you know, if you have anything coming down the line, you know, this is something that I think the commission would be interested in. And, and I think, you know, the package plants, we've talked about a yeah. number of times. There's mm -hmm. lots of potential there. We just need time yeah. to collect more information. Yeah. And so when I was when I was at the the commission meeting, my, my comments were basically like, I'm afraid that we're not going to have enough projects <laughs> to fulfill that. And it looks like we're there, you know, that, um, that we don't we don't right now. But that's OK. You know, we can, you know, like we said, just just shift that those funds. Um, and then just kind of leave them, leave the rest just sitting there waiting for our, you know, the new projects to come in and see what we get, where we're at from there. I mean, that. It's an invitation like a, to participate. Yeah. The money's just sitting there. Right. Daniel, you, had a, you want to say something? And then I wanted Vinny to follow up. He never got to finish what he started saying. Curious if we know the difference in funds from the septic to the muck, um, how much more it's going to cost us to ship those funds. Um. I don't know the cost. I did add up um, what was that? Oh, I went back perhaps too fast. There. So if the the hundred million in muck, uh, if those projects were not cut, those projects would re reduce annual flux by ninety thousand pounds. If you take that hundred thousand and you or hundred million, sorry, and you just fund the next septic to sewer projects on the the yeah, ramp there, you would remove sixty thousand pounds. And so, you know, yes, there's a difference, but they're they're all they're they're all good projects. So we're reducing thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand pounds. Thirty thousand pounds, excuse me, less for the same amount of money. Right. 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 So so if you did 30,000 pounds times $1,500 a pound, I don't trust myself to do math in my head in front of a committee. <laughs> well, but, I, I'd like to to yeah. I, but I'd like to comment on that. I go. Well, I think the, the point is well taken is that, you know, we've been, we have a scientific plan and we've come up with this recommendation and then the county commission came back and they say they're not scientists, but they want us to make a political decision. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's the way I see it. I mean, yeah, it's all good, but some are better than others. And muck is better than the other ones. So I, I would just like to, I, I think we have, a, a, we ha already have a scientific and a political plan. Because we haven't used, we have, we have based up our plan on distribution among different areas of the lagoon to handle the politics of getting this passed. We have made our distribution between different approaches at different cost thresholds to make sure that we address those different technologies in an equitable manner that people could buy into. Our plan, while it has a lot of science, also does have politics in it. It does. Now, that being said, I, I understand the discrepancy here, too, but I, I look at it a little bit. If you, We have to add the time component in. You know, that muck, the muck itself isn't necessarily growing on its own. It's growing from other contributions. Those septics represent an ongoing contribution that, um, that's going to continue forever. So at it's some point, year. we got to, mm -hmm. I, understand it's, I understand it's current year, but for instance, if we take away all the muck and we don't deal with stormwater and we don't deal with septic, we're going to recreate the muck. But I understand that the muck is hiring at a, I mean, fluxing at a higher rate than our current septic is loading our I system. Agree. And that's from so many years. So we're reducing our current flux rate. I am not a scientist by any means. 
but I've really tried to wrap my mind around this. So the muck is contributing at higher rates than septic, and it's going to cost us $45 million more to switch this plan to appease politics. I, I just I think it has a time component too that today it's fluxing that much more and so today if we were to complete those projects yes we would reduce that flux but 20 years from now we haven't addressed the incoming sources and so that flux would have regenerated but I think that's where the plan does address all the different issues in yeah. a very good balance and where'd the hundred million come from that's a, that's an arbitrary I've never heard of rationale for the hundred million Right, I, so you know that was just pulled out of the air. So I, I, I have a lot of trouble buying into it, quite frankly. Charles, it's where I think it, Todd's suggestion of a compromise there. Well, and, and, and I, I like that yeah. to a point. But you know, I've talked to some people, and they want results, right? They want to see something happen, and, and mark <coughs> removal provides some really good results, and I think it shows the community that we're working with their tax dollars and efficiency. And now we're, you know, we're going to go back and not be very efficient with their tax dollars. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have a lot of trouble with that part, too. Bill? I have a science question um, that may or may not help in this particular conversation. I, I know that there is a question mark on the, you know, and a presumption that, you know, if we don't stop the inflow, we're just creating more muck. My understanding is that muck is not mostly organic or not necessarily made up of these types of contributions. So if we can take a couple minutes real quick and recap on what all of the you know presentations we've heard so far, I've watched so far, <laughs> um, regarding where does muck come from so we can understand the actual source of things. You know, if it's, if it's sod and, you know, construction, dust and things like that, uh, in a certain area, and that area is already grown out, is muck going to continue to accumulate? That's a question. Um, so I was hoping that we can really quickly talk about that. So I'm just uh, worried that the presumption mm -hmm. that s septic and sewer, et cetera, creates <coughs> muck is uh, causing unnecessary confusion. So muck is about 90% water. Mm -hmm. And when you take that water out and just look at the dried component, 60 to 70 percent of that is silt and clay. And Dr. Shreffery's talked about the likely source of that being sod. Mm -hmm. The organic fraction is, is 10 to 30 percent and varies from one muck um, collection <coughs> aggregation point to the next. Mm -hmm. In, in addition to sod, poor land management practices. Mm -hmm. So sod would be in that same category. Right. Old, er, you know, erosion control. Yeah. There didn't didn't used to be much in the way of erosion control with construction. That's that's something that's been improved on tremendously in the last decade or two. And I understand from the last meeting that there's going to be more um, isotope centric data collection uh, on these matters. So is that going to be applied to these muck dredging projects as well? Um, so there, there was a motion that we look at more isotope data. Um, we've had some conversations about that. I'd really like to bring in, you know, a panel of speakers again so you get a better feel for what data is out there versus what the gaps in information might be um, before we, you know, run, run down a path too quickly. Right. Okay, Vinny, I know you had some comments on specific projects. Yeah, first off, I apologize. I didn't know Virginia had a presentation going. I thought we were going to start discussion or I would have just sat here quietly and like, sure. I, like I just didn't smile. So I do apologize. But thank you, Dr. Windsor, for, for reminding me. I, I need that. Um, so I, I uh, th there are a few things that what, what Todd was talking about was kind of where my mind was going. The, the few things that haven't been mentioned are schedule-wise, the workshop is scheduled for the 18th of October for the commissioners. Our next meeting is the 19th, I mean October, April. April. Our next, next meeting is the 19th. Mm -hmm. So um, there may be, and you know, I, I, I'm just throwing this out there because I don't even know, there may be time for us to come up with a direction, but not necessarily have a plan and let the county commission go at their workshop, let us talk at the workshop, so that they feel better than the day after we go ahead and say this is what we'd like to do. I don't know. The other thing is, is there is 
28 million, if I'm correct, Virginia, in a um, septic conversion program for residents to apply for to help convert their own septic. Um, that money has not been spent, and for a very good reason, and it's a terrible one that Virginia was very, I was frustrated, we were both frustrated together. And uh, the, the, the state legislature's current permitting does not provide a successful septic tank install. It has to do with wood chips and wood chip linings, and uh, Virginia loves to talk about it, so if you want more information, you can get it from her. But basically, if we were to uh, incentivize people to replace their septics, the only permit you could pull would not put a, a, a winning solution back in that place. But there is $28 million more in the plan that would be put towards septics that is not included here. So I, I just don't know with the timing with the workshop if we want to push in a direction and let the, let the commission get together and talk about this and let them hear ours and then we make a vote the day after. Um, and then again, there is that additional 28. The other thing is the package plants um, the way that I had seen all this was to leave some aside um, because I do think, again, low-hanging fruit, like Danielle is talking about, it's all pound per nitrogen. We're not going to be able to fix the whole lagoon at once, so it's all about how efficient we spend our money. So maybe if we did leave some and then let them come back with some uh, numbers on the package plant. And again, every year, what is it, four months, we're going to be mm -hmm. looking at, at projects again. So every year we do update the plan. Mm -hmm. So this is what's going to be this year. Um, and will affect what work is done now, but we do have a, a chance again to, you know, course correct at the end. I'm sorry, Courtney, please. Oh, no, you're fine. I, I just um, wanted to echo that, you know, the the comment is well received. I, th I think that needs to be, you know, stated that, yes, it, it does not take as much out and it costs more the way we're shifting it. However, Given the current legislative opportunities here, um, with Randy Fine's bill and others, these projects, if we could get started on these septic projects now, that would give us some opportunity to leverage our funds even more and get some of these projects off the ground. Because I don't think we, I don't think we could say that you know shifting a little bit from muck to septic is bad. You know, it might not necessarily be optimal in the grand scheme of things, but when you're looking at a timely opportunity and, you know, like uh, you got to be able to move a little bit over, <laughs> you know, as things come up, things come up. And I think, you know, like you said, with the um, public sentiment, you know, I, I, and unfortunately I think there's, you know, some drummed up sentiment there, but you know, it is what it is. But I think we have an opportunity with the, the bills coming through to really capture that. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I don't think it would be necessarily bad to, to do, this shift at this time, you know, so I think that would, that's an opportunity. Um, and I do, but I do think we should leave some openings there, you know, for the projects that people have been working on, but necessary, but haven't made it here yet. Um, and that way we can react to that when that comes about. So, because we want to make sure that we're able to fund projects when they come, because if you, you know, we don't want to say, oh, sorry, you know, we, we changed our minds today <laughs> when people have been working on them. These projects take a long, long time to do. And um, so we want to make sure that, you know, we're flexible enough to be able to react to when they come through to us. Um, so I, I, I would agree that um, shifting these the way you have recommended, Virginia, is, is a good idea. And um, hopefully that we can, when we hear a little bit more from the county commission, we can maybe make some more decisions after that. Um, but I don't think it's a necessarily a bad thing this year to, to be able to start shifting things over to septic sewer, particularly in the packaging plants and some other opportunities with the utilities if they come through. Because I think we have some matching opportunities at the state level, which, you know, definitely helps us in the long run. So. And it does lower the cost. If we yeah. can get matching mm -hmm. dollars, then right. our actual cost per nitrogen do go down. Yeah. Exactly. If, if we can get them. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a saving us money. I agree. You know, so if this is the year for sewer and, and septic, by all means, let's jump on that and get that part done, you know, and, and get and get it started. All right, so, oh, John, go ahead. Is it about time for the public comment? Um, are we proce are, we're not proceeding with any type of decision today. Well, it sounded right. like there was a motion. Yeah. Is there, do we, have a, do we have a pending motion today? 
I well, think regardless, we're going to have to have a motion on whether we wait or don't. I think that yeah. should come in the form of a motion regardless. Uh, we should well, listen to the Yeah, so we, well, I could, we could take public comments on it. I, I, would, I would suggest or kindly ask anybody who wanted to comment to um, <clears throat> keep it regarding this matter and not general comments, or the general comments section at the end of the meeting. Was there anybody who wanted to speak about cards, David? the yeah. subject at hand? David, do, you do you have cards? cards? Sorry? Do you have cards? Cards. 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 Oh, <laughs> I thought these were all general comments. Yeah. They might be. No. These no. are not general comments? Okay. These are all regarding the issue we're talking about right now? All right. First up, Brandon. Brandon Conroy, please. Uh, thank you for letting me talk today. I'm speaking on behalf of myself only. I'm Brandon Conroy. I have a PhD in marine science. Uh, my background is I did about a year's worth of harmful algal bloom work at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution before starting my PhD. I got my PhD at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science uh, looking at a large-scale phytoplankton bloom and what controls it uh, offshore in the tropical Atlantic. So I have a pretty good background in nutrient cycling in uh, in phytoplankton blooms and kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get too much into the no dredging, dredge or not. Um, I think I, getting rid of that muck is certainly a good thing overall, but looking at the priorities, and I'm glad that you brought up the isotopes. <coughs> so I watched uh, so Dr. Treffery's talk February 11th, talking about what muck was, and he kind of hinted at, we need to know what the sources are. We need studies to look at the isotopes. Those studies exist. They have existed. I did a very quick literature review. In 2015, there's a lagoon-wide isotope analysis by, uh, from Harbor Branch. 2017, they also did it. That was a little more centric to uh, the St. Lucie estuary. And then 2018, published in Marine uh, Pollution Bulletin, is uh, tested again the whole lagoon. All three of those studies using stable isotopes show the sources of the nitrogen phosphorus are sewage, right? So this kind of back and forth on, they're both bad, but you know, when I hear science-based and you're ignoring the peer-reviewed literature, I mean, I've only been here two years, I'm a Virginian, I kind of have personal reasons why I haven't come earlier uh, to talk to you guys, but when I've been getting more and more involved with this just through my interest in personal uh, interactions, I'm kind of beating my head against the wall sometimes in, in what the argument is over. When you have some really good studies that show, and, and also just my background of knowing kind of coastal eutrophication, very rarely have I ever heard muck as the major source. It's certainly fluxing, but a question I have, all right, it fluxes. What's the flow environment of the lagoon? How quickly does it circulate? Right, so it fluxes, but where does it go, right? Well, to the water column, but the water's not moving, right? So phytoplankton, plankton means drifter. It's controlled by the parcels of water it's in. All right, how is that then going through a 120-mile system like that? I mean, yes, you've got decades of this building up. Sure, I'm not arguing that muck is, is, is good or we don't need to approach it, but really, like, there's some evidence, and... I can send the PDFs to whoever I need to. I didn't know who to send it to. That those studies have been done. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk to anyone. Um, or, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. I do, real, real quick, Brandon, I do want to thank you for coming. And, and I, I, I want to hear all this stuff. I want to hear all the information. All our email addresses, I believe, are on the website. No? no, but if they if you send it to me or, or Brandon, we will share it with the full committee, and we have sent them copies of, of some of those papers, I believe. But well, they're not we'll in the report. That's what, it, as far as I can tell, that's what I was basing it on. The 2016 plan when I moved here, I read the whole thing. Brandon, can you come to the microphone? Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, our 14 viewers at home, and I met yeah. one at the uh, Straight Talk Symposium. Nice lady, Sue. I, I would say, I mean, I feel like that maybe came across a little critical. When I moved here, I was super excited to even hear about this. Like, I mean, this is a kind of local government taking taking control of an issue, and you guys have a really good, you know, option or opportunity here, and and so that's like you know when I read that 2016 plan in its entirety, 
there, you know, I did have some head scratchers, but I was like, okay, well, I'm not as familiar with this environment. There are experts here that, that do. And it does differ, like I said, from other places where I've studied or know about. But um, yeah, like even in those updates, I didn't see, certainly the 2015 one, maybe that's, I don't remember the publication date, maybe it wouldn't have gotten incorporated in the initial plan. But certainly in the next cycles of those, I'd expect some, you know, the literature review to continue. And then, and again, I mean, not to be ultra critical of the mucking, because I think, or demucking, but even um, uh, Fox and Treffery's paper, that one that was published in, in August, highlights that it's only 63% effective at removing. So you're resuspending this stuff, that's in the abstract, right? And again, that's a little critical in that they couldn't get to the entire footprint because of docks and structures in the way. Mm -hmm. Yet that's going to be an issue. But again, saying, We've got this footprint, we can suck it all up, demuck it, isn't the whole story either, right? So when you're looking and talking about the numbers and efficiencies, like you guys got a lot of money and a lot of opportunity here. And I think the analogy that I've thought of the most is trying to mop up a puddle without turning the hose off, right? Like you gotta look at those sources. And again, can argue what the sources are. I'm not the expert on that, but just kind of looking at it, and especially when the isotopes, and I, and I don't see that there's a paper that shows what the isotopic signature is of muck. So that might exist, I couldn't find that. But if you're looking at kind of the source, you know, flux and comparison, that's one of the next steps, is just look at the isotopes in the muck and in the water column above it, and then in the phytoplankton. But there are two really, really good studies that show lagoon-wide isotope published in peer-reviewed journals that I think answer a lot of the questions, or at least what came up from the last COC meeting that I watched on TV, and then I came here today. So. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Can you Thank can you, you be sure? And, and I don't, since I'm new, and I would love another round of scientific papers to look at, um, especially because I understand, and I've been following this from afar as well, the the, the 15N isotope and uh, some of the issues in its ability to really distinguish between actual sources yes. versus, you know, other organic decaying matter and things oh, like yeah. that. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's certainly, um, there are ranges typically when you talk about, especially like N15. Right, it's yeah. a I'm ratio. just really hoping to understand that. Yeah, so if you have, I mean, there, if I, can, to... I can send you all you want on that. I yeah, mean, <laughs> that'd be <laughs> but great. Thank it, you. It, yeah, there's definitely, I'll, I can recommend a book too. That's a really it. good yeah, can overview on it. Real quick comment. I just want to point out that in the plan, we don't have all of muck dredging. Uh, no. There's a uh, yeah. significant, right now, even before all of these changes, dedicated to water reclamation improvements, septic to sewer improvements, and so on. So so it's not really like an either or, it's just a shift. No, it's, it's end, and it needs to be end. Yeah, it, it, it always has been, is what yeah. I'm saying. No. Yeah. And then the other the other thing I just want to point out is we don't, we don't ignore anything. We just We may have a different opinion. Um, and some people may put a lot more emphasis on one thing other than the other, but we always want to see more information. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Like you know, we don't we don't want to. I, I hope that there is no perception that we ignore anything. We just haven't. You know, we we may just disagree on. No, that's fine. I, and I didn't want to come here and be accusatory or, or anything like that. But that when I when it, what really drove me is when I saw the 2019 update and these papers still weren't really referenced even as far as I can remember, and maybe I'm wrong on that. Well, there's just so many papers, you know, so we have to make sure that, you know. But I'm, <laughs> if this was brought up by the people. I would, I would just offer, there's, there, there's more to, and, and to Courtney's point, this is, not, this is not either or, this is and, and there's a broad range of threats to the lagoon, there's a broad range of mitigations to the lagoon, and there's more to muck removal than just the nitrogen loading. Oh, no, certainly. That contributes to the overall health of the lagoon. So uh, I, I don't want this, this uh. cannot become a, a, an argument, a disagreement about, well, sewer is much better than muck right. or, or any of these things, right? We need to do them all. So I just want to make that point. It's not just nitrogen loading from, from the muck removal. And the, and the other thing is just to clarify the point, the issue you raised about the 60 million or whatever, the 30 million, I guess, is we're really talking about timing. We're not, we're not increasing the overall cost, right? We're just shifting. When do we, when do we pay for septic versus when do we That's pay correct. for muck? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, I just wanted to make it aware that those 
studies exist. Thank you. So. No, thank you for coming out. All right, so before we, before we um, invite another speaker, we will get to that. We have five minutes left in our regular meeting. We're going to need a motion to continue. I'm going to suggest 30 minutes. Motion to extend 30 minutes. Second. Do we have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And before we do that, I have to use the restroom again. So I'm going to ask for a five-minute break, <laughs> and then we'll continue, and then we'll finish this meeting. Anyway. <coughs> Continuing with our public comments, I wanted to invite Mitchell Roffer of Melbourne Beach to speak. Hi, for the new members and perhaps some of the old to remind you who I am, or who I was and who I am today. <laughs> um, I have a PhD in biological oceanography from University of Miami. Prior to that, I was studying for my master's up at Long Island University, where I was also working for the Nassau County Department of Health. I, the new company which I formed last April focuses on education and environmental advocacy. I've been living up in Melbourne for Melbourne Beach for 12 years, so I'm quite familiar with the science and the, um, the politics involved. So the, the question you have to come up to decide, and it's a changing decision, is whether or not muck is more important than sewage at this time. Granted, more research is, it has been done and, and, and produced about the human aspect of it, and I certainly don't want human pathogens in my water compared to muck. Um, certainly pictures of sewage going into the lagoon, including pharmaceuticals, which we really haven't talked about, is, is a major problem and question that, that is, is taken up in, in the Save All Lagoon plan. One thing, after going to the commission meetings and, and coming here, is I really believe you need to trust the science. Not necessarily the politics, and yes, politics are important in this, but you have staff scientists, you have scientists in public that are providing input, and you have to learn the science to it to be on the board and act. But please act for the science-based decision-making, not necessarily the political needs. Um, I'm happy to see that, that uh, Virginia was <clears throat> mentioned the need to update the databases and updating the sciences for all the, all the canals. And th this is critical. For or order to you make the complete integrated decisions that you have, you need to have the data. If the, if the cities are not reporting to you what they're doing for their dredging projects, then that's a loss for everybody. Um, but what I, I realize the problem of sewage and septic is, is really critical. But I think the problem in, in sewage and septic is much larger than what we have here. I think what I would like to see taken up here is a recommendation that you go to the commission and say we need a bond to really take care of updating our infrastructure for sewage and septic. We have a billion dollar, probably a billion dollar problem here, and it's here now and it's only going to get worse as time goes on. So. I would like to see you take care of, of, of the septic and sewer, not necessarily at the cost of muck, which is putting in nitrogen too, which is causing blooms, which causes the fish kills and then other pathogens to go into our system. But the sewer issue, we have a degrading sewer issue. If you went to the commission meeting recently, they talked about stuff that was built in the 1950s, these lifting pumps. You, you wonder why they fail? It's because they haven't been maintained. They're so old. So I, I, two points, go away points. Go with your scientific staff, and also please put forth the idea of a bond to update the county's sewer and septic. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know we, we don't have the ability to put forth a bond. No, you can't put forth. Oh, that's in the I don't You're asking. Thank you. Suggest I'm asking you to that you recommend to the county. Okay. And one, of the, one, one thing I forgot, too, which you mentioned before about leveraging future money. One of the things that came up in the county commission meeting recently was the commissioners were really upset about idea of let's do something now based on future leveraging and future legislation because they said everything that has been presented as future leveraging has failed, has not come to fruition at this point. And while we have, it seems to be a changing attitude in Tallahassee, even Representative Fines felt that he stands a very small chance of getting his bill approved the way it was first introduced. So we all like the leverage. We all like to get federal grants on top of this. And by doing this, it will help. Just the virtue of us cleaning up, you're going to get the leveraging that you need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, I'd like to invite Matt Fleming of Satellite Beach.
How you guys doing? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. I, uh, I, I'm here on behalf of fishermen everywhere. I see that contractors and cities and utilities are all very well represented. Um, I, I've lived on and, and fished the lagoon for over 20 years. Uh, I've traveled all over the state, very familiar with our state's waterways. I've done a lot of homework on this stuff, so I'm becoming more and more familiar with it. Is there anyone here that can tell me how much a brand new dredge costs? Wow. Most recent beach dredge cost 90 million. For the, the barge. The, for the dredge. Yeah, for, for a dredger, though. Barbs, the actual equipment to, that's used to dredge that's stuff out of the river. Yeah. Okay, does anyone know anything about the costs of what these projects are? They, are contractors required to submit cost reports on how much it actually costs to buy pipes and to dig a DMMA pit? Mm -hmm. Well, short answer to your question is yes. And when we take on, when we look at a project, there's RFPs, there's proposals, they're reviewed, they're reviewed again, they go through a voting process. Is is that information publicly available? Yes. Yes. On online, where anyone can go look. I don't know the efficiency of it being available to you to, to read, but I know it's all public information. Maybe Virginia can elaborate. We do not ask for their profit margin right. on mm -hmm. any specific job. As part of our financial review before we award contracts, we do a a financial analysis of the company and whether the whether the likelihood that the company is going to have the wherewithal to be able to complete the job that they're bidding on and so we look at their um, audits from the last year or two to make sure that, um, that they're stable and so um, as part of that we do look at their overall profit margins um, you know, recent profit, but not on a specific job by job basis. Is like there, I believe is there somewhere you would send Matt to uh, at, at, with the county to to be able to access the public records associated with a, a bid award for the, a dredge project? Right. The purchasing department would have all of that information. I just I, I feel that it would be helpful to the public uh, to have that information posted online and, and easily publicly accessible by anyone. Because how can you have good input from the public? if the public doesn't have good information. Uh, my next question is, is anyone here familiar with Laguna Madre in Texas? Yes. You guys, so you guys know that it, it's much more similar to the Banana River uh, in terms, just the dynamics of it and, and the problems it faced than Chesapeake Bay or, or Tampa Bay. Is that my time? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, please take a stuff. look at that and, and please, Dr. DeFries has said he has pilot programs ready to go for bringing ocean water into the lagoon. It, that is the, the public interest <coughs> as opposed to other interests. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. John, John go ahead. A, a point of order. Uh, typically during public comment, we get comments from the public and then we can address them later. Mm -hmm. If we go into this back and forth, we could be... Yeah, I thought I, I thought today's public comments were a little bit special. Um, it's a very heated subject matter, and, and we're 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 in conflict with with um, uh, to some extent with the commission. And I know it's uh, um, these comments are are emotionally you know, driven today, maybe more so. Okay, so I, I, have the, I, have a, I have a motion to extend the meeting for another hour or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have two more. We have two more speakers. I know one's John Durkee. Uh, it's going to be long-winded, but uh, uh, I'll try to keep him in check. And then uh, Commissioner Loper. So, he went to the bathroom. Who did? John? Um, Commissioner Loper, if you want to step up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. So I, I didn't initially plan on speaking when I came here today. I just wanted to make myself available if, if there was something that pertained to the commission that I was uh, capable and comfortable answering. Um, but I, I was listening to all the back and forth up here, and there were several points that I, I thought would be useful to make uh, to hopefully put everyone on the same page in terms of uh, where I stand. I'm not here representing the commission. I suppose I'm here representing a fifth of the commission, uh, and that's about as far as I can go. In, in terms of um, just a, a few thoughts that I have that I want to share with you all, not necessarily all cohesive, and I'll, I'll skip with the segues, 
Uh, but as far as a workshop, and I've, I've spoken with several folks on the COC about this individually, uh, I'm not going to go to a workshop that the COC puts on, and I'll, I'll tell you just in, in brief why. Uh, everyone here uh, that's sitting at this table, everyone out here, uh, everyone anywhere has had the opportunity to make their case to the county commission twice when the Sorrel Fund issue has come up. Uh, in addition to that, every single scientist that's reached out to me without exception that wanted to meet with me, either I've gone to them already or they've come to me. That includes folks at this table and folks in the audience out there. Um, I serve on the IRL NEP Council representing Brevard. Um, I can tell you I've spoken with folks from St. John's River Water Management District. I've spoken to folks with DEP. I don't know that I've spoken with anyone with the EPA. Uh, I've gotten every bit of knowledge that I, I care to absorb from each of the different factions, uh, if you want to term it as such, with respect to the different ideas and the different priorities. Uh, so I'm not here to relitigate the merits of demucking versus infrastructure. I think that everyone is essentially where they're at. Um, and frankly, I think having folks come at the, the last meeting in which, the last BOCC meeting in which this came up, essentially saying, you know, we're not providing you any additional information, but please approve the plan as, as was originally submitted. Everyone knew that wasn't going to happen. Um, I understand that folks may disagree. I respect that, that your opinion may be different than mine as a group. Um, but fortunately, unfortunately, depending on, on where you're standing, everyone's position is fairly clear. So I, I do want to point out a couple things, though, that hopefully will make people feel a little bit better about the situation. As far as the, the $1,500 to $1,200 a pound range, there are a couple thoughts I have with respect to that. First off, that I don't believe is factoring in if Randy Fine's bill passes, in which case we may be looking at 750 against 1,200. Um, the other thing is my understanding, and I invite Virginia to correct me if I'm wrong, because I've been wrong on, on many things in my life. Uh, that $1,500 quote, or the $1,500 cap, and the estimates that are used for the septic to sewer projects are based on, at least in part, some studies that are many years old. Uh, we have older infrastructure now, the failure rates are higher, and by extension, I'm concerned that the, the amount of nutrients that are being exported as a result are higher. Could I, could I ask for a little bit of an extension? Sure. I appreciate yeah. it. And I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, part of what I noticed on the slideshow is we had one slide that talked about 90,000 pounds of nitrogen versus 60,000 pounds, and then I, you know, I was leaning over to Fritz, who works in my office, and I said, over what period of time? And then, thankfully, Virginia answered that, and she said, that's annually. I, I don't care as much about a particular date and time and a year from that particular date and time. I care about a particular date and time and a decade or two decades later and what's going to give us the most improvement over, over a lengthy period of time. Uh, I've used the fish tank analogy. I'm sure everyone under the sun has heard me use the fish tank analogy, and that's, that's essentially my logic for that. Um, I understand it's simplistic, but it still works, at least in so far as that argument's concerned. Uh, I basically just wanted to make myself available to, to let you all know if there's some particular proposal what I think is likely to pass. Again, I can't speak for the commission. What I will tell you, though, is we're, we're in a situation where everyone is essentially where they're at. I would encourage folks here, regardless of what it is that they choose to bring to the county commission, not to view this as as akin to buying a house or buying a car and saying, well, let's come in with a low offer or a high offer and maybe they'll come back with something else and we'll meet in the middle. Just give us a genuine offer. Um, if what you come with us or come to us with is something that's palatable, I don't know that anyone's going to be nitpicking it to try to, to squeeze out an extra five or ten bucks to go to a particular cause. Uh, I will tell you, though, that my intention, and again, I don't speak for the commission as a whole, at least not, not in this capacity, uh, my intention with the $100 million holdback was to have a very substantial amount of that go toward infrastructure. And I, I don't necessarily limit that uh, to septic to sewer. I think that looking at plan upgrades is also something that you may want to consider. I, I don't want to micromanage. I don't want to tell you all which particular projects to, to pick. My thought is sending it back here gives you all the buy-in that you're intended to have. And I'd rather let you all have that end of the process and make the in-the-weeds decisions and if you come back with, with something that fits within those confines, it may well pass without there being any back and forth, and it saves everyone the aggravation. So I said I'd be brief. I've, I've already gone over my time. Other than that, you know, I said I'd make myself available for questions, and, and that's about really it. Really quick, Commissioner Lover, are you going to be at the meeting on the 18th or no? Sounds like no. 
No. You won't be there? No, I'm, I'm not going to go to the workshop. But you're available. Respectfully. Available uh, but for? You're avail well, you, you mentioned that you're available, I think, five times in the last three minutes. Commissioner Lower, that's but the Board of County Commission workshop, not ours. Oh, the BOCC workshop, Correct. yes. Yeah. Yes, that, oh, okay. I apologize. I heard there was, a, I, I apologize if, if I was confused with respect to that and I misspoke. I, I heard there was a separate workshop that was being proposed by the COC to invite the BOCC to. And if that's incorrect, I apologize. I'm referencing the one the one o'clock meeting on the 18th. Yes, if it's set by the BOCC, I will be okay. there. All right, thank you. Can I, I just have a real quick question. Go ahead. Okay. We were talking about because we don't have projects to meet that 100 million, would you be okay with a section that's just kind of sitting there until we get the sewer utilities and everybody? If, if need be, absolutely. Okay? What, what I will tell you is I've been working with our utilities director yeah. okay. to try to push him to make more available to you mm -hmm. so that you at least have an option yeah. or a set of options to choose from. Mm -hmm. okay. So if, if it's not there, it's not there. Okay. I, I, can't, I can't make you do what's impossible. Okay. Or he it, needs time. Okay. Yeah, we're practical. Yeah, so we just need time. So if we could just sit it out there like, you know, um, un, unallocated or something like that, that's going to be okay with the commission you think Again, you, you, at least. with me at least. If, if you can't do something, I can't, I can't begrudge you for that. Okay. So if, if you're only able to address the first 30 or 50 million or whatever the number is at first, let's get through what we can yeah. and then we'll pick up the remainder of it when it's right. available. Because they're so long term anyway that, you know, we just, that way you we're, we're not going to hit it the first yeah, year anyway. Right. So I'm, I'm happy with okay. that. Okay. Sir. Uh, just a clarification, and I heard this at the, at the uh, I think it was the 18th meeting. You used the term infrastructure and then, and then later you said, I, I think you said plant upgrades or plant increase. So, so your expectation is in the comeback to, to uh, dispositioning of the $100 million, you would be looking for contributions directly to the, the improving the public utility infrastructure? Not necessarily. All I'm trying to get across is I'm open to some creative thinking in terms of what constitutes mm -hmm. infrastructure. So it's not, it's not limited by mine. Uh, to septic to sewer. If it's all septic to sewer, that may be fine, but if there's not enough by way of projects that are, are reasonable to, to pursue, then I would say if there's something that's outside that scope, certainly consider plant upgrades if it ends up reducing the, the uh, nitrogen loading at the end of it. If we have uh, plants that aren't AWT compliant, it may be something to look at. Again, I'm not trying to get into the in the weeds decision to do your job uh, that essentially really you all want to do and we quite frankly don't want to do. Uh, but if it's something that, that gives you a greater variety of choices, then by all means, you know, feel free to consider it, but don't feel compelled to, to, to go in that direction if that's not something you want to do. So, so just a clarification, right? We do have wastewater treatment uh, projects in the plan that are enhancements to the public utility. Right. And, and secondly, I think by the nature of the, of the bill that was passed for the taxes, we are, we are precluded from spending money on the public infrastructure. The, 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 ones, the half cent tax does not provide for that. If, if there's a lawful obligation not to spend it for a particular purpose, obviously I'd, I'd say comply with whatever the confines of law require. Uh, but I, I don't know that it's quite as clear cut as, as you may be under the impression that it is. My, my thought is not that, that uh, I guess to, to just to put it bluntly, I'm not looking to use the Sorrel funds to subsidize the utilities, but I also don't want to penalize a project that also has the incidental effect of benefiting the utilities, if it's something that's good for the lagoon. Yeah, that's I, that's yeah, where I'm right. coming from. Right. I, Thank you. I would just like to add that, so while, while we're here and have the benefit of talking to you on that, yes, I think the committee has been very consistent on that in that the committee has supported septic to sewer, that has supported extension of centralized infrastructure, has supported upgrades of plants that go beyond mm -hmm. minimum regulatory expectations. The one place that we as a committee have not supported is that uh, replacement of infrastructure that falls within traditional maintenance responsibilities of the utilities. And that, that's been where we've drawn the line. And that may not be an issue and at that's, all. And, that, and I think you'll find that all of our discussions have been very consistent. So some of the projects that you mentioned as far as advanced wastewater treatment and upgrade of plants, um, I've seen, I think, almost every project that's been brought forward that's yeah. even reasonably cost effective has been approved of that nature, and my anticipation is would continue to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as we start to talk about repair and maintenance when there is a dedicated funding source from utility revenue Understood. and there's an ongoing maintenance obligation, that's where this committee has not been supportive of it, and I know as, and, and as, as a member that I would. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put out just on, on, that, on that topic as well. 
I don't know, and again, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I don't know that the appetite is there on the board or on the, on the county commission for issuing bonds to get over that initial hump or for raising rates. My, my personal philosophy, and it's not gonna change whether I'm in this room or I'm downstairs, is to get over that initial hump. I don't wanna, I don't wanna raise rates. I think that's a solution that, that ought to be designed more toward once the system is up and running where it ought to be, maintaining that level of service. And if we need to raise rates to maintain a level of service, that's something I'll certainly entertain. But in order to get over that initial hump, I'm, I'm not looking at, at raising rates. And bonding out, it, to me, would be a, a last option. So I, I, would, I would respectfully suggest, even though it may well have been something that, that's well thought out and well intentioned, that the appetite just isn't there as far as encouraging the commission to, to bond out to fix the infrastructure at this juncture. I, I think he was talking about us bonding out, right? Well, no. Yeah. No. Oh, oh, I'm not sure. I mean, there's real yeah, funds. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think our position has been that's not the place for SORL funds. Right. And then and then you have a tough decision as a county commissioner to figure yeah, I, out where the money comes from. I don't know that um, I would I would be no. supportive of, of using SORL either. funds in that way either. So, just, I mean, that's, yeah. and, and, and at that point, Comment, I we, think. we agreed like yeah. at the beginning of the tax to, to try to do a, a cash basis project so we just the, the funds are large that seems we, responsible we do, that. Yeah. So. do we know um, for the workshop on the 18th um, will the utilities department be able to uh, demonstrate any viable projects that might need consideration of bonds <coughs> I may have to defer to Virginia on it, but my understanding is we may have some information, but not necessarily line item level information at that point. But I'll defer to her if she knows more at this point than I do. They are working very hard to collect information to be able to identify projects to potentially submit for your review for the 2020 plan update. Um, they may have a few ideas ready to share um, by the workshop on the 18th, but they're really pushing to come up with projects. Mm -hmm. consistent with what the committee has recommended in the past um, yeah. that would assist the utility. And that, and that's the only Brevard County utilities, right? Yes. Because right. that, that's my concern. I know Commissioner Overy said he reached out to Eddie and the utility yes. serves. And I, I, maybe that's, I, I don't know how you would feel as a commissioner sure. telling it, but we sending the same email as far as are there any projects available to the other utilities? Just because yeah, I know absolutely. if something, if we'll something comes time. here absolutely. and we go, oh, it's for county commission, you know, county, we don't want people to come at us and say, all you're doing is funding county mm -hmm. projects and mm -hmm. I live in Cocoa Utilities. Right. So That's an excellent point. I, I think sure. if we can bring the, every, everybody to the table, and I know the workshop's going to highlight the Brevard utilities, but I just want to make sure that, that other utilities know, mm -hmm. let, let's get it all together and, and fix the problem. And, and I just wanted to point out, like, at the previous, when we have our workshop with all the partners, mm -hmm. We do that, and that's why we saw the Cocoa Beach right. project, you know. So, but I think now we can have, you know, we'll see these projects come in at our next workshop, which is around the October time frame, right? September, October. So, um, at that point, then I think, you know, that gives the utilities time to put some of this stuff together, you know. So, that's why we were, I was at, you know, wanting to see if we could leave some on allocated for that reason, because I think we have an opportunity there, especially with the bills coming through the legislature. So. Okay. Unless anyone has any other questions, I'm thank you, Commissioner Lower, for thank availing you. yourself to our, you so our scrutiny up from our end. <laughs> thank course. you. I know yes, it's been an unorthodox <laughs> uh, public comment period. <laughs> yes, it's sir. Not, it's not every day we have a, a commissioner, you know, visit us. So thank you. I appreciate thank it. You thank you all so thank much. You. Um, our last speaker, um, I think, is uh, Mr. John Durkee of Merritt Island. Man who needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> not going to get. But we, one. you are yeah. lunch, so I just. Hey guys, um, I'm going to actually be. I'm going to John Durkee, Merritt Island. I'm going to actually be very brief, which has never happened before. Um, a reminder to Virginia: the breeze swept project. An update on the monitoring that was done, with the probable shift in funds toward more septic removal, which I generally support, so I don't like, anyway, um, knowing that it worked and being able to demonstrate to the community that the removal of septic immediately removed fecal matter and other and nutrients uh, right off of, in the Indian River off of Rockledge would be useful. And we spent the money on the monitoring. Um, go ahead. I'm going to use this time. Sorry. Do it. The, um, that the final report has been given to the city of Rockledge, the draft final report. They're reviewing it right now. And so we should be able to have that to you for your next meeting, but we couldn't, we couldn't get it for today. Thank you. Um, and then 
the discussion of long term and it's outside of the scope. Thanks, you guys, for explaining where we have always kind of drawn the line. Mm -hmm. Long term, the sewage infrastructure in this county, the wastewater treatment system, the runoff system, et cetera, has to be upgraded and repaired. We got 70 years of development that we have to replace. That is not, as everybody understands in here, the challenge. It is, however, the challenge of the utilities, the municipalities, and the counties to figure out a way to fund that because it's not sorrel money. Um, it's interesting to be out here and to listen <laughs> and to watch. Um, I, my impression is there's a whole bunch of people out here. We all want the same thing like you all do, which is to improve the lagoon. And everybody's got little ideas that they think are better as opposed to a big overall. And I appreciate that you guys are having to do this work. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Thank so. you for spectating, John. <laughs> yeah, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying it. So, but thank you. That, but that was it, Virginia. Just a reminder. Have a great day. Thank you for being here, John. Okay, before we continue, that was the end of public comment. Um, we need a motion to extend uh, probably for 15 minutes, I would suggest. Motion to extend for 15 minutes. Second. 15 minutes. <laughs> are, you, are you sure? You think we need more time? No. No? no. no? Okay. Kick the can. 15 minutes. Uh, we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we are at the point where I think... We had um, one or two people that wanted to to um, submit a motion for um, coming to a decision on allocation of projects. Um, and I think Virginia might have prepared something. Did we okay. prepare anything? No. I can I can start. I can try. Oh, you have something? Yes. Uh, Courtney, proceed. Okay. Make a motion to stop permitting investment on the two orange bars in your muck dredging section, which says Hineda North and NASA West, that's the muck dredging project, and use and use ship those funds to Cocoa Beach Gulf. Okay? Mm-hmm. Then use the $125 million approved by the BOCC and $25 million of the $100 million hold for all muck projects of 1,000 pound nitrogen flux reduction plus the O'Galley Northwest. Got that? I do. do. You understand that? Request $32 million to fund all sewer infrastructure projects in the table up to 1,500 pounds of nitrogen reduced. Leave the remaining $43 million to be allocated in the 2020 update and di direct staff to coordinate with the cities and other partners to submit projects in the next cycle this fall to include utilities. Do we have a second on that motion? You guys understand? We can have discussion. Okay. okay. So I can do a diagram if you want to. <coughs> Does that include yeah. the 15.4 million shortfall in the month? Yeah. No, right? No. Not that. Not that piece, no. It's just the 36. Well, then would you remove the Go Creek? Because Virginia said if we're not going to do the um, <coughs> Mullet Creek one, then we shouldn't do the Go Creek. I motion that you amend it to get rid of Goat Creek and divert those funds to Cocoa Beach Golf. Okay, I'll accept that amendment. Was there a second on the original motion? No, no we're, we're, we're in discussion at the moment, but I like that. Maybe you can revise your I, motion. We should have discussion until we have the second. I'll second the motion have, for discussion. We don't have an official motion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can we get tech support in there? <laughs> that sounded Jurassic Parkish. It did. Lorraine? So I second the motion. Okay. So we can open discussion. So I think Danielle is proposing an amendment, an amendment to move the Goat Creek 400,819 to the Cocoa Beach Golf. Yeah, project. I also suggest one more amendment. The okay. three additional smoke testing areas, I suggest that we wait until we learn about other um, opportunities for lateral inspections and just hear it before we agree to pay for that. 
So would that go into the that would be that would be deducted from the thirty two million okay, and for added now. to the forty, added to the, the balance that was going to carry over to next year. Yes. I'm fine. Can, can I make? I just wanted to make an observation. I know I, I said it before. Um, that would be thirty two million we're putting into septic, and then I think you said there's forty left left over. So that would mean we're, we're adding 15, 10, 15 to, to mock. 25. 25. 25. So we'd be doing 32 to septic, 25 to muck, and holding on to the rest. Yeah. And I, I, I know, uh, and to Daniel's point in the graphs we look at, I know that the graphs we showed and, and the numbers can show, you know, whatever, muck is higher than, than, than it is um, what we can tell, the nitrogen coming mm -hmm. from, from the septic. So what, what, I, what I wanted to do, and I think that 40, the 43 number to me was high. So my original plan was to do the 15.4 shortfall, the 36.6 shortfall. So basically I would suggest an amendment to Courtney saying that we, we do all the muck to the left of the orange. We do the septic that's been discussed. And that leaves us, I think, with 16, 20, somewhere in there. So that way we're spending 32 on septic, we're spending roughly the same, if not a little more, on month, and then we're leaving the rest, the remainder, which is 16, 17, to then be decided on at another time. 15. I, I think so we should, could I, could I just real quick just comment on that? I don't think that's going to pass. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the reason why, you know, we were asked to do, to direct this $100 million in muck dredging to sewer issues and if we come back with okay we're we're going to do that with 32 million and the rest is going to go to dredging I, I just don't see that getting through the county commission and we're just going to end up going back and forth right. and and create a lot of animosity and so i think what 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 we should i think the reason why i thought the cocoa beach um, golf project was important was because of how far along you know some of the cities have done a lot of pre mm -hmm. pre work to that to mm -hmm. that um, and, and I don't know I if you want to add, comment on that. I was just going to add, and the cost efficiency of it, because right. it's down at about $550 per mm -hmm. uh, pound of nitrogen. So yeah. when you look at cost, it's, what we talk a lot in averages on cost, but that particular project is very cost effective, as opposed to some of these others that are in that twelve or right. $1,500 yes. range. So for me, that's a very positive investment. And so I think, well, I just want to, you know, I think, the, when you explain a rational reason for that to the commission, that that may be more acceptable than, you know, we don't agree with you. <laughs> Do you know I, what I, mean? I, I, I just wanted to respond, just respond back. And, and I, I, I hear, I know um, what the commission has asked us to do. I've reached out and had conversations with a couple of the offices or some of the offices, and I, I, it was received very positive um, from a majority of the commission. Um, what I just said. So I, I don't know. Again, that was an office, not necessarily a vote. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, I, I just think for me, I know, um, I, I feel that that, that muck is, that, that we have here, this is his original plan and these plans were done. I, I would like to, I would like to continue um, until if and when, you know, if there's Randy Fine money next year or whatever, I like we call it Randy Fine money. I'm just going to call it Randy Fine money if he wants to uh, trademark it. But um <laughs> I don't know. I, go ahead. I think I want the same thing that you want really bad, but I think we should leave it unallocated. I think that we should request the difference of the shortfall for Cocoa Beach Golf. And so I think we should take off Pinita, take off National Aeronautics, okay. take off Goat Creek, allocate all of that to Cocoa Beach Golf, request that the county commission improve the amount from 125 to cover the shortfall difference just for Cocoa Beach Golf because it's so cost effective and because it's the only big project we have for the Banana River right there affecting. <laughs> when I'm looking at septic, I'm not seeing anything that's going to affect that area. So when we're looking at the lagoon as a whole, I think it still provides a great amount of balance. Leave the rest unallocated and approve all of this except hold off on um, how we're inspecting lateral lines. Mm -hmm. And I think what you just described was Courtney's. That, that's exactly well, was, what I was That was Courtney's okay. motion yeah. with your amendments. Right. Okay. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. What yeah. the difference was. With clarity. Yeah. Right. 
And I think I, you said it better. I, I, would just, <laughs> I would just like to add one thing to Vinny's comments. The other side of this is that 15, remember we, we do a plan update every year. Mm -hmm. And so that 15 million, we can always come back to that next year. We've yes. got additional, we may have additional information on how projects are moving forward. We may have better insight into legislative funding. Because candidly, if, if some of this septic funding and contributions comes through and the septic tanks, the septic conversions are now half price, it may not make right. sense to go for that 15 million toward that if, if now septic's conversions are 750 yeah. bucks. And so if, the, if this legislative funding comes through, we ought to be spending money on septic because it now becomes a very cost-effective yes. solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't preclude us from coming back to these in the future. It just leaves it. When I felt the same way, putting the money in, it doesn't preclude us from readjusting it next year. But it's, it's six of one, half a dozen I the other. So I, I think it I gives think us a better chance. And of you're passing. sending a message to the commission that we're trying to do what they want. I yeah. mean, that that's that's the issue I have, you know, with because I think number one, I think we really need to stay flexible, particularly with the legislative, you know, opportunities this year. So if we keep it unallocated, then we can come back and, and address that in the year. Really? Sorry. Um, I just have a question. Why would you stop the permitting process for yeah. Pinina and on um, the NASA Causeway? It, it, since we, we're hoping that there's going to be money further down the road and it takes so long to get these projects permitted, why would you tell them to stop, mm -hmm. stop trying to get the permits now? Um, well, permitting costs to, to actually get permits in hand costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Per project. <coughs> that answers my and so, <laughs> yeah. so, so we're only you know, 37000 into those two combined. And so... You know, if, if we're not going to have the dollars to construct them, we shouldn't spend hundreds of thousands yeah. permitting them. Okay. So we have a motion that's been seconded and amended. We can vote on it. I don't know if it warrants a rereading of the amendment for clarification. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing it out Anybody there. Anybody need a rereading? Re Christine, do you think we, we should pass it and then read it? Does everybody understand the, what's what's <laughs> with the motion before us? Yeah. Okay, you guys get it. Okay. I was going to do a Vanna White thing. <laughs> but we have clarity. We all agree on it. We all agree we have clarity. We can bring it to a vote. All in favor wait, of the wait, motion? Wait, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry, John. Uh, there's some in information that was presented to some of the board members. that's new today. And some new ideas. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars in changes. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way we can approve this tentatively and then come back and revisit it to give everybody a chance to sleep on it? Uh, I, I don't like making big decisions like this. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a snap decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, again, they're going to have their you know, workshop. I, sorry, sorry, Dr. Winter. Pardon? I was going to say they're going to have the workshop on the 18th. They, they are, and there's no reason why they can't be told that we tentatively approve this approach. But I, I would like the opportunity if, if, you know, we should be able to revisit this at the next meeting in case anybody has any reservations after this meeting's over with and they go back and look at this stuff again. I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I'm okay with going forward with it, but I just, I just don't like moving this fast. I appreciate Thank that, John. You. As one of those who didn't see any of this in advance, that the fact that it all fell down and people have pre-prepared motions and <laughs> knowledge and so on is just, I mean, I'm not real thrilled about that, but I'm a backbencher, so maybe that doesn't matter. Um, so, um, I just yeah, want to say I didn't prepare. It we, have a, we, you know, we have an <laughs> well, obligation to, to, to keep the ball moving good. forward. Yeah. We have the obligation to keep moving. Yeah. Um, and um, I can understand and appreciate the, the burdens placed on natural resources and the commission. And we're, we, this keeps getting revisited. I also appreciate the need for us to think about you know, major decisions like this. I don't know what Robert's rules would be for a provisional um, um, voting on a, on a motion. I don't know if we need to table it to, to next month or if we could have some type of provisional motion to, to, um, to, to sleep on. Christine? My suggestion would be to table it until your April meeting. You have the workshop coming up on the day before, so there may be some information that you learn at the workshop that may change the, the vote that's on, on the floor. Dennis? 
Uh, Robert's rules also allow anybody that's part of the uh, vote in, in the positive to bring that back to the uh, table at any time. Mm -hmm. um, you can do a vote today. Uh, if we're following Roberts, I assume we are. Uh, bring that vote today. Anybody that's in the positive can bring that vote forward after you think about it. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's have a discussion, a brief discussion, a very brief discussion about tabling, tabling the vote and revisiting it next month. I'm okay with going forward with the motion. Yeah, do and, it that and if somebody way. has a problem between now and next month, bring it back up for reconsideration. I think it would be nice to have the commission understand where we're going so they can actually discuss that. Mm -hmm. and I think that and piece of can bring it back if it's okay. not good All right. and timely. So don't tell me it requires a motion to table the motion. No, no. no. We just keep going. Yeah. Okay. We would just <laughs> All right, so we're going well, to. No. Yes, it does require a motion to table the motion, but that's not the that's suggestion. Not the, the, motion the, option is. Oh, the motion on the Sorry. table right now is to continue. Yes, yes. to continue. Yes. Yes. Okay. Go with Courtney's yes. motion. Yeah. With as amended. Right. As amended. Call the vote. So we are going to vote on the motion as amended by Danielle and Vinny, I believe. No. Um, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? The motion passes. How does it impact things if somebody comes back? I think that brings us to final general comments. If anybody hasn't spoken today, I don't have any cards, uh, but we have five minutes left. That's uh, been uh, approved. Are there any? Are there any general comments by the committee? Just real quick, can I just Courtney, say go ahead. really big thank you to the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition for their event um, at the FIT, the Gleason Center. There was over 400 people at that event. It was really well done. They did a great job, and I just wanted to say thank you. What a great organization. So. We, have a, we have one public comment really quick. Yeah, it's just a question of how, okay. to, get, how, how to get that motion so that we can communicate that as part of the coalition. I don't have it, so you could figure that. Out. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was really you write it down. Well, you know, we'll, tape recording. Yeah, we'll we'll get that motion turned around quickly. Quickly, yeah. excellent. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And I did just real quick, David. I tell you, I, I I just reached out to Virginia in between meetings and reached out to the commissioners. So that's how I got the information that I got. Um, and it it's timely. Uh, it does take time, but that's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is, first, this is the first that I saw this today. So people saw it earlier yeah. because they asked for it. I don't yeah, know. this is the first I saw it. Mm -hmm. as well. I was just on the phone with Virginia talking about it. <laughs> I'd just like to add that uh, uh, the realtors are uh, descending on Tallahassee next week. Uh, and one of our primary uh, items this year is water quality throughout the state. Got 188,000 members, and there's probably going to be 3,000 of us, 4,000 of us up in Tallahassee. Um, I'm going to be one of those, uh, so it should be interesting. Thank you for We'll send you our legislative priorities. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> okay, if there's no other comments, meeting is adjourned. So, thank you. Yes. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor, and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.